So guys what if godlike Naruto is a mortal Saiyan in Dimensional Chronicles movie? It's been quite some time since I was able to just sit down and look over this place. A figure spoke, peering over the city that sat under his perch, said figure were somber at best. His usual trademark grin seemed to be a distant memory at the moment as thoughts of his past seemed to plague him now. It's changed a lot, don't you think? He turned to face the creature he aimed such a question towards, a human-sized fox that took its sit next to him. Its visage was something lost to time to those that resided in the city below a crimson fox with a wicked grin and nine tails that flickered behind him with reckless abandon. Quite, the crimson fox responded, laying his frame down atop the rocky terrain as he, like his friend did before him, began to scan the area below with a far more critical eye. Generations have come and gone. Our way of life has long since passed us by, Naruto-san. The figure chuckled, running his hand through this mane of spiked blonde hair, San. When did you start using such language with me? I suppose you deserve it every once in a while, you have done more for me and my kin than any being, living or died, so, I suppose a respectful honorific is the least I could do, the fox responded nonchalantly, his tone that of a respectful ally of many years, something the figure appreciated. My cold, dead heart just skipped a beat, Karama, Naruto mocked with a faux whimper, something the fox didn't take too kindly towards. Drop dead, brat, he hissed, much to Naruto's amusement. There it is, he smiled only for such a thing to fade from him as a stern expression to its place. Naruto began to look upon the supposed city once more, this time looking past the large buildings and bustling streets and began to find the outline of his old village which once rested exactly where this city now stood, the Hokage Tower, his home, Ichiraku Ramen, Tenten's workshop. All of this and more seemed to appear to him in some form of an imaginary blueprint, reminding him of how much has changed before his very eyes, I think it's time. Time? The fox perked up, tilting an ear towards his command of generations now. Naruto's head hung low as he spoke is a voice now filled with a somber resignation. I've buried my kin, my friends and family. This world I once called home no longer needs my protection or even my presence. I think it's time I find myself a new place to call my home. The fox nodded. He understood better than anyone what it was like to watch those you've loved and cared for to be lost to time. It took a heavy toll on him along with his comrade. Finding another place to call home would be the next logical option. For a being of your stature, finding a new home won't be easy. The man smiled lightly, don't worry, old friend, I've used my time wisely, I've spotted quite a few that I can inhibit relatively easily, my concern is for you, what will you do? Humph, your concern is touching but unwarranted, my life will be quite content without you being here, he remarked, releasing a content sigh at the prospect of his desired isolation. Naruto cocked a brow to such a statement, what, you, here all by yourself, I don't know if you could handle the boredom. Believe me, I've had enough excitement to fill 10,000 lifetimes, it'll be fine to live my final one in true peace. True peace. Weren't you the one who mocked me for wishing for such a thing, spoke Naruto. Recall all those years ago how humorous the notion of world peace was to the fox in question when he still resided in the pit of his stomach. For you mortals, peace is like the rising sun, it is inevitable to set no matter how hard you fight it. However, I can finally find peace for myself within this world with the generations passing and all but one biju now residing within you. Our legends have grown into myth and myth into dust. I am nothing but a ghost of a bygone era and with that. I can find my peace within my final cycle, he explained rather curtly as the last few centuries began to come into focus. Years after the fourth shinobi war the shinobi world was set upon once more by war and infighting. The sacrifices of those on the battlefield seemed simply in vain as those who desired power could never truly submit to peace without equal or greater force. So, to protect the bijus from subjugation once more and to obtain strength to create peace with his bare hands, Naruto became their vessel, absorbing Karama's kin and 90% of his very being in order to become the perfect ten-tailed Jinchuriki. This drastic change was enough to finally cement the idea of peace into place, a figure with a power of a god in the palm of his hands who only desired peace gave the world he looked over a neutral yet powerful force to keep this world in line. He was looked upon as a hero and a god by some and by others a dictator and an unholy demon, and in some cases he was a little bit of both but every decision he made, every person he helped or fought against was in the pursuit of peace, something that he has now finally introduced to his world. Naruto stood, 
Dusting himself off as he let out one final sigh so, he said, looking to his companion with a fond smile, this truly is the end, huh? You speak so grim about this, have a spine, brat, there's nothing left for you here. The fox chuckled, shaking its head in disbelief, such a being who faced countless horrors now seemed scared of starting over once more, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad to think about. Your bloodline has dwindled into nothing more than a dot on this world's gene pool. The idea of chakra has been lost and your way of life has been forsaken. All you can do now is take your knowledge and power to another dimension. One that might need you as we speak, though, as Karama spoke he did have to remember that Naruto still is human and with that came an attachment to the familiar. This is indeed his home, where he built his house and created his family. How can someone forsake such a place so easily, isn't that your plan? To continue this foolish crusade of being the child of prophecy? To end suffering, not for your dimension but those that rest before you? Hi, Naruto answered, then go forth, stand here no longer reminiscing with this old fox and follow your purpose until the end of your road, who knows, maybe that road shall lead you back here for you to watch one final sunset over your home dimension with me. Karama smiled, closing his eyes almost in an attempt to allow Naruto to leave in peace. However, Naruto didn't wish to leave just yet. As the fox closed his eyes the man came to him, knelt to his height and hugged the fox. Something Karama wasn't prepared for. You're right, Karama. Thank you. The fox merely hummed, laying a single paw on his shoulder to reciprocate before they broke apart. However, before I leave I must visit one final place. Humph. There's only two places I know you'd give up your precious time for and seeing as Ichiraku's is nothing more than a distant memory. I suppose you're going to go pay your final respects, he asked, getting a nod from his partner in arms, don't worry, I'll watch over their final resting place with my life, you have my word. Once again, thank you old friend, until we meet again, and with that, the man vanished in a mix of yellow and white light, leaving the aged fox atop the mountainside, his features seldom and dull as the thought of his friend's departure saddened him more than he let on. This world may not notice nor care of your departure but I do, I'll never forget what you've done for me Kit, ever. Location. Unknown the flash of yellow and white appeared once more. Revealing the man draped in a cloak as he stared upon a vast. Untouched field littered endlessly with tombstones each labeled with names, dates and their respective nation symbol. This was the land of the fallen. A millennia prior Naruto set out on the extensive task of retrieving the bodies or bones of the men women, and children of his past and laying them to rest in a place where they'd remained respectfully untouched for the rest of time. This place was the ruins of the land of Whirlpool. Another task he took under his wing was to rebuild his clan's fallen homeland. But not for the purpose of beginning it again but rather as a place where everything simply ends and is allowed to rest. These tasks would seem like an ungodly undertaking if this was anyone other than this particular Uzumaki, the child of prophecy, the one who cares the Jubi's raw power, the blessings of both the sun and moon symbols gifted to both Sasuke and himself and, the most potent, the unstoppable will that he was born with. During his rebuilding, he decided to create a small cottage to live in on this massive expanse of land on top of the highest hill to give those at rest their respect this cottage is where he spent most of his remaining existence in this world. He walked down the well-worn cobblestone pathway, allowing his bare feet to scrape across the dulled stones with ease. There are those in his earlier generations that questioned his desire for walking. He can teleport with a blink of an eye and yet you'd find him strolling from place to place as if he was normal a god posing as a human. Well, I suppose you could chalk that up to his still intact humanity that found a form of pleasure in physical strain of moment. Feeling his skin flex, his muscles tighten and his bones rub were things that he surprisingly missed once he gained this new form so had tried to take what he could get. This was the same man who still actively partakes in training daily, something that most who knew of his power would find laughable though, unlike how it used to be, he must transport himself to another empty dimension lest he causes an untold amount of damage to this one. As the hardened stones gave way to the grass at the bottom, Naruto made his way through the fields of tombstones, reading their names aloud and granting them a thank you and a farewell. Sasuke Uchiha Sakura Haruno Kakashi Hataki Ino Yamanaka Choji Akamichi Shikamaru Nara Tamari of the Sand Gara of the Sand. Tenten Neji Hayuga The names continued on and on, each one spoken brought back fond memories to the immortal who fought alongside them. After what felt like hours, Naruto came to a halt before the final tombstone, or rather, memorial display of his six greatest loves, Kashina Uzumaki, 
Minato Namikaze, Jiraiya, Boruto Uzumaki, Himawari Uzumaki, and his beloved Hanada Uzumaki, he stabbed his staff into the dirt and knelt before their coffins, a single tear streaming from his left eye as he struggled to find the words that his family deserved. My first farewell shall be for you too, Ka Chan and Tu San. He spoke somberly as he looked to their hand painted images he hung above their gilded coffins. In my younger years, I beg to know and spend time with you too, I'd give up anything for such an honor, and now, on my day of birth once more, I'd still do so wish that if I could spend at least one true day with you as a family, however, the moments I have spent with you, however brief, filled me with hope and determination that has to lead me thus far. I wish to thank you for everything you gave up to protect me and, if you can still hear me, I love you both. Now, Jiraiya he said, shifting to look to his fallen mentor, these are the words I wish I could have said to you while you were still with me but I was too proud to speak them, you were like, a father to me, you gifted me with not only knowledge and strength but kindness I'd never had up until that point those that have met you would consider you a lecherous, old fool, and at times, you were, but to me, you were far beyond that, you were my first true bond. Himawari, Boruto his voice caught, the pain of a parent outliving his children slowly eating at him, a pain he has tried to repress, I, I know, I wasn't the best father to you too, why you deserved the world and at the time, I couldn't give you that. Why your mother, she tried to help me save face in front of you but in reality, I was scared. I knew nothing of being a father and I tried my damnedest to act like one but, but I was only making things worse, in time though, we grew a different bond, one that fortified our family as one and made us strong in both body and mind. You too grew to become powerful Kunoichi and Shinobi in your own right and started your own family and as I watched you two grow I was the proudest father you could possibly imagine. I am honored to have been in your lives and I love you too dearly. Thank you for granting me the honor of becoming your father. Hanada, he spoke, taking the few steps towards the top of the altar as he placed his hand on her coffin. As his calloused hand dragged across the stone coffin he couldn't help but still feel the residual aura of his wife still ever present whenever he finds himself near it. I don't think with all the time in the universe on my side could I explain how much I love you. Words cannot do it justice, but, I can always try. As a child, I was ignorant to your affection towards me. As a teenager, I thought such love was merely platonic. It was only until I was a man that I realized how deep your love for me ran and how much I could love another. We've had our differences in life, some playful and others. Not so much, but through it all you always saw me as the boy you fell in love with all those years ago, even in your dying moments, on the day you passed I felt something in me go with you, I thought that was a piece of me dying so I could follow you into the afterlife so you wouldn't be lonely, I hope that's true and I hope that, through that piece of me, you can hear my final goodbye, I love you. Hanada Uzumaki, from now until the end of time. Making his way back down the stairs, his farewells now said and his final words spoken. He pulls his staff from his position and deactivates it, returning the once decorative staff into nothing more than a black orb of chakra. Tapping its base the orb flies up into the sky, about 200 meters above Naruto's current potion before expanding at an alarming rate, passing through Naruto and the island itself. The orb now surrounded them in a perfect bubble of protection. There. Naruto spoke, I can rest easy knowing this place is protected. I guess, it's time, he sighed, his body now lifting into the sky as he activates a gift given to him by his fallen brother in arms. Sasuke Uchiha, the Tamai Rinnegan, once activated a black dot appeared one meter from him. Growing in size as the space around it seemed to twist and rip from the force emitted by it, this continued to expand until its circumference was as wide as Naruto giving him easy access to the dimension he had picked out, staring within the orb revealed the other side where this newly created portal created, a barren plain with grass patches dotted around it, peaks of perfectly white mountains acting as a backdrop to the stark area. This was the place he has picked for his new adventure, this spot may seem boring but the world that it resides in is anything but, at least from what he could tell when he scouted it out 15 years ago during his exploration, with one final look to his old home, he stepped through the portal, making the first contact with this new world in over a decade. I wonder what changes await him. Let's see what this world has in store for me, he thought, as the portal closed behind him. Anon was the first sound that greeted the ageless one as, mere seconds after his portal closed, he was blindsided by a spiral like an attack that slammed into him with the force of a Mack truck, exploding with a thunderous roar. Flashback. Five minutes prior what a treat. Such idiocy is all too rare nowadays. 
yelled such a vile woman as she placed her boot against her opponent's prone body like a hunter posing on its price catch. Said woman's appearance screamed a boastful brute, her wild spiked mane trailed down her back as it ended in the small of her back, her eyes were cold and remorseless for what was about to transpire, her attire was simple, a brown and black set of battle armor with matching wrist attachments, a look that seemed almost designed for an army of sorts, something that only exemplified her status, and to think I even considered you ready to join us. Why you scum? Her victim whizzed, feeling the pressure building on her chest as she tried to resist but to no avail, she could feel her sister's boot grinned against her exposed chest as half of her orange GI was shredded through the previous altercation, leaving half of her body exposed to the elements, the only thing covering her shame being bandages that she wrapped around her chest. A true warrior never hesitates to kill, not even for her own sister, she cooed before a twisted grin appeared on her features, care for a demonstration? The brash warrior cooed only to continue on her path without her prey permission, stomping firmly against her enemy's chest, getting several harsh cracks along with a guttural yell for good measure, her onslaught to the pronged orange-clad hero continued, each stomp bringing forth new and painful cracks and pops which would send shivers down a normal mon's spine but only brought laughter to the abuser no hurry, sister. Suffer more. Your screams are like music to my ears. The woman snickered, grinding her heel deeper into her sister's sternum, satisfied with the reaction she was given. However, the snickering warrior grew serious for a moment, eyeing her other opponent, a green-skinned thing that wore a purple GI, said thing stood a solid yard away nursing his sizable wound, a missing left arm, courtesy of his previous bout with the cackling warrior standing before him, and you there, be patient, you'll get your turn soon enough, or rather, how about you take a shot at me now, huh? Maybe it'll add to my enjoyment. D damn it, he hissed, electing to allow her suggestion to pass as he tried to think of something, anything that could help him in this predicament, she's taunting me. She knows all too well what would happen if I attack now, damn you, Goki. If you had thought for two seconds we wouldn't be in this mess. What, no words. Fine then, sit there and keep quiet. I'll be with you in a moment, she cackled, turning her attention back towards her downed sister. Now, where was I with Yoham? She began only to stop once the device attached to her head began to let out a high-pitched noise, alerting her to an ever-growing power level to her right. What the? She began, turning to face whatever this supposed threat could be only to be shocked when the pod she came in exploded as a small child ejected herself from it, rage and malice caked on the little girl's features. Landing on the edge of the pit she escaped from the youngling struck a wide pose, baring her teeth in a defiant stance against her new opponent, G. Gohan. Goki whimpered, shocked by the child's show of strength, however, her surprise was soon abandoned as her motherly instincts took hold, G. Gohan, run. Get o out of here. W what? What on earth? Raditsa commented, tapping the side of her scouter in order to get an accurate reading of her enemy's power level, 1307, P power level that's impossible. The Saiyan warrior muttered, the scouter on her ear reading out the ever-growing power level of the child before her. Why you? The child began as the ground surrounding her began to shake, why you hurt my mama? A white hot ball of energy grew around the child after her primal yell, an energy that came from deep within her, hidden potential buried in her more gentle nature, before the Saiyan warrior could react to this sudden build of energy. The child shot forward with a speed unheard of for a child her age as she slammed her body harshly against the Saiyan's armor, knocking the wind from her lungs and cracking several ribs along with her armor in the process. Ooh! Piccolo shouted as he watched on in abject shock as a child no older than four weakened a mighty warrior so easily, something that neither he nor the child's mother could do together, however, his shock was soon silenced when the Saiyan warrior found her footing once again, gripping her chest but ultimately still standing. Along with the warrior's recovery came the Gohan's emotional shift back to her previously timid self after landing near her mother. Oh wow! What h happy, Gohan whimpered, rubbing the growing knot on her head before she noticed how close she was to her mother which brought a smile to her face, M mama. Gohan. Goki spoke, still taking in everything that just transpired moments prior, G Gohan. Run, she yelled once she noticed her sister's quick recovery. Why you, little, brat? She roared, catching the child's attention. Ah run now, Gohan, run away. Goki uttered as she tried in vain to stand to defend her child. Your power level, it's dropped back to one, she hissed, growing more enraged by such an action, so, 
Your power level is tied to your emotions, huh? Well then, you're nothing more than a liability. Raditsa rose her hand high and delivered a hefty blow to the child's head, sending her flying a few feet away, leaving Raditsa and her mother alone once more. And no, stop it. S she's just a child, just a child. You must be joking. The brat, for only a moment, had more power than either you or that green mongrel had combined. Pity, shall never learn how to use it, she all but growled, taking a few strides towards her target with vicious intent. And no, please, you can't. Oh trust me, you'll meet her again in the afterlife. She chuckled, preparing to deliver a final blow to the prone toddler. As she raised her hand to gather energy she felt two arms wrap from under her arms and lock behind the back of her neck, sinking her into a full Nelson, H huh? Why you can still stand? P Piccolo, now. Do it now. Goki yelled, feeling the energy within her draining fast. I have to build to it, you fool. I need time, Piccolo yelled, placing two fingers onto his forehead as he began to build up his key once more. Why didn't you grab her tail? See cause, she can cut her own tail off. Goki quipped, much to her sister's dismay. Why you, no? She hissed at her captor, twisting her frame in hopes of flinging her sister off of her, to no avail. P please, Piccolo, hurry. I, I don't know how much longer I can hold her. Goki yelled, feeling her broken ribs shifting under such pressure. See curse that brat, his attack left me weakened. Raditz's thoughts began to grow more desperate hoping to possible reason with her sister once more, K. Kakarot. Think with your head for once, why you'll die too if this attack hits. Hey. I it'll be worth the trade-off, she whimpered, sweat now pouring from her as she could feel her grip slipping. Raditz's eyes bulged, disgusted at such a claim, I am possible. What type of Saiyan are you to throw away your life like that? I if it's the only way to defeat you, she murmured. Son Goki, just know, I will not hesitate to kill you along with her is only a bonus for me. Piccolo quipped electricity and yellow energy crackled from the tips of his fingers, his attack almost ready to rip through both of his targets, of course, if your friends still have the dragon balls. A hey, aren't you, done yet? M my ribs are broken, it's now or never. Raditsa was almost brought to tears as she began to see her life flash before her very eyes, was this truly how her life would end? Not if she had anything to say about it, sister, please. I'll leave this planet forever, you have my word. Just please release me. I am sorry, but I am not falling for that again. T this is the end of us both. Goki fired back, unwavering in her desire to see this through to the end. Sorry to keep you waiting, Piccolo chuckled as he sunk into a firm stance, readying himself for what was to come, prepare yourselves. Do it. No, wait. Special beam cannon. Present my goodness, that was a close one. A voice uttered through the smoke, his hand waving the arrant dust and debris away that was kicked up by the previous attack. I suppose my senses haven't dulled too drastically, if I hadn't blocked when I did I might have had some singed hair, haha. Ha. The man laughed lowering his second hand that took the brunt of the attack. W what the? Piccolo wondered as he tried to wrap his mind around what could have possibly happened. However, before any of them could do so Raditsa took this opportunity to assault her sister once again. Rearing back her head she bashed it against the bridge of her sister's nose, sending her stumbling back, giving her ample opportunity to attack, with a swift flurry of punches to her already damaged midsection and a hefty haymaker to her jaw. Goki was sent flying backward a few inches from where her unconscious daughter laid. What a prosperous day, not only was I able to fool my dimwit of a sister into releasing me, I also had another bumbling fool take a deathly blow for me. I'd say it was too good to be true if I didn't live to tell the tale. Raditsa cackled, stepping closer and closer towards her sister like a beast playing with its food, kicking her daughter out of the way she grips Goki by her collar, raising her up ever so slightly to get the perfect shot with her next attack, but I would say the most satisfying thing I shall do today is to wipe this universe clean of this miserable excuse for a Saiyan. She cooed, raising her hand high to collect an aura of pink energy for one of her signature moves, now, Bego. I am sorry. I hate to interject. A voice intervened cutting off Raditz's final words and her next move, seeing as the voice in question had her raised hand in a death grip, unwilling in his hold, turning to face the man foolish enough to stop her she found a tall, slender man with blonde hair and a calming yet stern look to him, but I cannot stand around and watch this. Oh, how bold of you to think you can stop me. Raditz a hissed, 
wringing her hand free of his grip, with her newfound freedom she darted away a few feet to gain some much needed space to analyze her situation. Damn it. My advantage keeps dwindling at every turn. She growled before tapping against her scouter to assess the newcomer's power level. As Raditsa continued her assessment of him, this supposed newcomer tends to the woman he saved, bracing her back so she could sit forward. The man gave her a calm smile before a green aura rose from his palm. Easy now. Everything is going to be all right. W who are you? A good question for another time. Right now, we must worry about the task at hand. He spoke as his hand surrounded itself in a green glow. Something that worried Goki tremendously. It's all right. This will heal you. I've. I, I've never seen this type of magic before. It feels great. She spoke, feeling her energy slowly coming back to her with every second his hand was on her wounds. Magic. Well, I wouldn't call it that, Naruto chuckled. W what on earth is he doing? Whatever that is, it must be some form of healing ability because Kakarot's power level is growing back to what it once was. Raditsa fists tightened once she started to put two and two together, and if that stranger can heal both my sister and her friend ill be stuck with a three to one disadvantage, this must end now. She thought, taking up a fighting stance before addressing her foe directly. That's quite enough talking out of both of you. Do you think ill just stand here and let you ruin all of my hard work? Think again. Naruto didn't seem to care all too much about her threat. Give me your name, he said, standing from his position. W what? I said give me your name. Raditsa scoffed at such a demand. What a strange request. Why? Because, I wish to know the names of those I've beaten, he commented as he merely folded his arms in front of himself in a rather cocky stance that boiled the Saiyan warrior's blood, with a simple glance over this field. I can tell this destruction and mayhem has your aura all over it. I won't let this continue. If you truly think something with a measly power level of 35 can take me on then you're as delusional as you look. She spat, looking over that data her scanner gave her. How about this? I'll give you my name once you're groveling at my feet for mercy. Raditsa declared before, in a blink of an eye, she vanished only to appear behind her target, prepared to deliver a devastating strike to his unprotected frame. However, Raditsa found her plan to be lacking once she made eye contact with her foe. Peering over his shoulder with an unenthusiastic sneer on his lips, Raditsa could only feel a suffocating amount of power radiating from him, something she has only faced once in her life when she angered Lord Frieza after a failed mission. Her arms went limp and her body stood stiff as her target turned to face her, raising a single hand towards her before tapping her forehead with his two outstretched fingers sending the fear-stricken Saiyan warrior three yards backward into a mountain range with an audible thumb. The strongest barks often produces the weakest bites, he spoke softly as he lowered his hand once again before going back to help his newly found friend, as he continued healing his companion. Piccolo stood aghast of what transpired. A man who merely appeared out of the blue has now placed the enemy he has been fighting for two hours now into a creator she has yet to emerge from, and from a finger tap no less. W.W. What in God's name is this thing? I, I am all right, really, I am, Goki interjected, grabbing the man lightly by his wrist to stop his advance before looking over her shoulder to her daughter. S. She needs your attention, please. I understand, he said as he softly scooped up the dazed child and placed his hand on her forehead, soothing the pain she must be feeling. Come here, little one. Everything will be all right. I've got you. M. Mama. The child questioned looking to see who had such a soothing touch only to find a stranger's visage looking back at her. Wah. Why you're not my mama. W where's mama? Don't worry, little one. Your mother is doing fine, see? He said, lifting the child to peer over his shoulder to see her mother, resting peacefully on the grass. Now, right now we must focus on getting you better. You must have put up a pretty tough fight for your mother, right? I I don't know. I can't remember much, Gohan murmured her shyness overcoming her ability to talk. That's to be expected, he said, the voice of a father still ever present in him after all these years, a few knocks to the head can do that. Why yeah, Gohan murmured as she peered up towards the mystery man with an intrigued yet calmed expression. Seemingly okay with this stranger and his actions, maybe it was how he spoke or his kind smile but Gohan wasn't fearful of this new face like she was with all the others, more so, she actually found comfort in him snuggling a bit closer to him when the wind began to pick up, however, their tender moment was soon ended when Raditsa, in a ball of white fury, rushed back to the battlefield, sporting a few nasty cuts and bruises from her encounter.
And no. No. God damn you. Raditsa raged, allowing her aura to run wild as it kicked up a mighty storm around her. I won't be made a fool of by the likes of you. I've fought in thousands of battle. I've conquered hundreds of worlds. This will not be the planet I die on and you will not be my final opponent. Raditsa cried before charging her key once more. The ground began to shake violently, far more than when Gohan unleashed his hidden potential, as lighting crackled outwards from her body before focusing all of her built-up key towards her right palm. Seemingly unfazed by her appearance or declaration, Naruto stood and walked Gohan back to her mother before making his way towards Raditsa, who at this point had begun to form a ball of white light in the palm of her hand. Have you yet to learn your lesson? Last time I gave you a love tap. You don't want to see me get serious. Give up and I might spare you. Shut up. Shut up. Radtiza refused to believe him. He was nothing more than low-class scum who got lucky. It had to be. You don't get to threaten me so easily. You are nothing more than scum under my boot. If you didn't go all out against me then you won't be given a second chance. Say goodbye to this planet and all of those who call it home. Kakarot. Raditsa roared as she darted upwards with blinding speed before releasing her attack directly towards those below her. Final spirit cannon. With a mighty roar, Raditsa threw her hand forward and released her attack with reckless abandon, preparing to wipe out all life forms on this miserable rock. G Gohan, stay behind me. Goki ordered, shifting her daughter behind her as she went to stand only to feel the wear and tear of the battleway on her once more. D damn it, I I can't move. I I should have known this would happen. A rat like her always has a plan B. Piccolo hissed. I hate to admit this but I am spent. Doing three special beam cannons in a row has drained me of all of my energy. If he can't stop this, we're doomed. Pitiful, was all Naruto said before he snapped his finger, forming a black orb over his fingertips. With little effort he flicked the orb towards the incoming attack and, with another snap of his fingers, the ball expanded allowing it to encompass the attack with ease. W what the? Raditz's breath caught in her chest as she watched the attack that held every ounce of her power behind it be snuffed out by a simple orb. As Raditza slowly lowered herself to the ground she watched as the orb that encompassed her attack slowly shrunk until it was back to its normal size, no trace of her final spirit cannon to be found. Dropping to her knees, Raditza gazed at the man with fear and dread as he called the orb back to him, petrified of what was to come. Now, are you finished? He asked calmly making his way towards her prone state with a cold gaze about him, something that didn't help Raditsa growing anxiety towards this mystery man, or must I demonstrate more how outclassed you are? Be by the gods, this can't be happening. Raditsa thought, her body frozen in place by her attacker's powerful gaze. T this can't be my end, it can't be. I, I was outclassed every step of the way by this, stranger. I, I can't die here, I just can't. Well? Snapped from her thoughts. Raditsa found herself face to face with her better, her racing mind now forever blank. Are you going to answer? P please. I beg you, spare me. She begged, falling forward in a pitiful bow in hopes of sparing her a few more seconds to think. Don't listen to her. Goki yelled from afar. She's pulled that trick one too many times. Once your guard is down she won't stop until you're dead. No, please. This time I am being truthful. I swear to you if you spare my life I, I ill. You'll what? His tone was cold, fostering Raditz's fear even more so than before, his eyes were stone cold and his stance was anything but friendly as he stood above her as if she was nothing more than a child he was scolding for misbehaving. With his question now asked Raditz's mind was now running through her options as fast as she could, hoping to stumble upon something that could save her from an early demise, I ill swear myself to you. She yelled those in attendance went silent for such a proclamation. What? Naruto asked simply, raising a brow to her statement. I I will give you myself. Everything. Mind, body, soul. Anything and everything that I was and what I can become will be yours and yours alone. J just please, spare me. She begged, hoping such a statement would be enough to play towards the mon's obvious god complex. With such a statement she could buy herself time play as his servant for the time being until she could gain some form of an upper hand against him, it was a rather risky plan but it was the only one that seemed appropriate at the time. Placing a hand on top of the pleading Saiyan's head, the man lowered himself to her before giving his answer, very well. Her once fearful expression faded behind a sigh of relief as she lifted herself from the dirt to address her newly appointed master, T thank you, thank you some you, W what's that? 
she questioned, pointing to the man who has now pulled forth a hefty scroll that looked to be quite thick. Oh, this? This is my companion contract, he said somberly, unraveling the piece of parchment until he could find an empty spot which, surprisingly, took a bit longer than Raditza was expecting. What, have you never seen a contract before? Why yes, of course, I have. It's just, why, exactly? She murmured nervously, her supposed plan feeling less and less plausible as he continued to explain this bizarre contract. Naruto shot her a wicked grin in response. What? Did you think I would merely take your word that you would follow me? I suppose you think I was born yesterday, huh? Hey, a Saiyan's word is her honor. Are you calling me a liar? She retorted, her Saiyan pride blinding her to her previous actions mere minutes prior. From what I've gathered your word is nothing more than hot air. Which is why this contract was designed, he explained, for the generations I've lived I have dealt with those, both with good and evil intentions, who have desired to give themselves to me for one reason or another, so, once you've declared such a statement, I ask for you to place a drop of blood within the seal below and state your new name. Once done, you will be branded with my mark, with said mark you will be bound by my contract, understood? You uh. Such a statement said so nonchalantly wasn't something Raditsa was used to. State your new name, drop of blood, branded with my mark. All of this seemed rather cryptic and far more binding than she had originally anticipated but, what other choice did she have? The orb that held her previous attack still hovered over the mon's shoulder almost like a reminder of his power over her. It was a sobering reality to know she didn't have much to bargain with at this moment in time. Do you have reservations? You seemed so open to the option mere moments ago when your life was on the line but now, you seem a bit hesitant, he remarked playfully, something that sent a cold chill down her spine. I I've never dealt with something like this. When a Saiyan pledges themselves to another it has nothing to do with mystical contracts or markings, but their word and their word alone. W what if I refuse? Such a lie was quick for Raditsa to come up with, if she was known for much in this world it would be her ability to weasel out a lie or two to save her from trouble. He tapped his chin in thought, almost as if what he was about to say next wasn't planned, then, your supposed plea will become null and void and I will subject you to the same pain and suffering you wish to subject to this planet and its people to moments ago, doesn't that sound like fun? Her visage twisted into a heavy grimace at the thought of being forced to deal with such a thing, a poetic yet gruesome end to her life to be taken out by her own attack, a all right, all right. I, I understand, she answered, her voice betraying the tone of defeat that was painted on her face. Perfect, now, he said pulling a kanai from his back pocket and tossing it to her, let us begin. V very well, she shuddered before taking the kanai and slashing it against her pointer finger, bringing forth the bright red blood of a Saiyan warrior, W what next? Place a drop onto the seal below, he said, pointing to the swirl-like design in the center of the scroll before directing her finger over it, allowing a single drop of blood to land in its center, once done the seal glowed a bright red, its black ink slowly be filled with the blood given to it, now, speak your new name. Raditz she began only for Naruto to interject, no. W what, she asked. I said no, she seemed a bit annoyed by his simplistic answers but tried to hide it the best she could, lest she is deemed unruly by her supposed new master, but you told me to speak my name, that's my name. I said speak your new name, your old one shall be forgotten. Why? She all but yelled, scrunching her nose in opposition. Because the person you once were before you signed my contract shall be no more, you will be drawn anew, now, speak your new name. She paused, perplexed by such a demand but seeing as she didn't wish to see what would happen if she denied it, she began to think of a name that would suit this new chapter in her life, Jine. She spoke plainly as a tinder smile appeared on her lips, something that looked almost foreign on the warrior's usual hardened exterior, however, once the word was uttered an unholy pain began to burn itself into her chest forcing her to claw at her armor, ah. W what the hell did you do to me? The final stage of the contract, the marking, he responded, wrapping up the scroll as Jine found herself gasping for air, it's painful, I am sure and I apologize for that but it must be done, this holds you accountable for what you spoke of previously I will give you myself, everything, mind, body, soul, anything and everything that I was and what I can become will be yours and yours alone, well, this makes sure of it. Arg. But why must it hurt so damn much? I've tried a few variations of the marking a number of times and trust me. This one is the most pleasant, the pain will be over shortly, trust me, and true to his words, 
The pain began to become far more bearable as time went on, going from a tortuous singe to a mild throbbing pain from time to time, making it slowly back to her feet. The now renamed Jain pulled at the collar of her armor, peering down to see the same symbol on the scroll now burned into her flesh, a whirlpool-like swirl. Why you weren't joking about branding, huh? She murmured, placing her hand against her armored chest in hopes of dulling the still tender spot. There are very few things I want joke about, my contracts are one of them. What the hell is this guy? Well, now that that's all settled, I think it's time we join the others. He said in an all too chipper tone, shifting from his disturbing calm demeanor to his original cheery. Almost ditzy one in a blink of an eye, with a snap of his fingers, the hefty scroll laid before him and Jain had now vanished into smoke, retreating back into the seal it once came from. Oh, he cooed, looking to the horizon to see a flickering image come into view. It looks like we're about to have some company too, how exciting, he snickered before he started to make his way towards them which, in turn, brought Jain with him. Capsule Corp. Hovercraft said flickering image was that of a Capsule Corp branded hovercraft. A state-of-the-art one at that which could travel hundreds of miles within minutes instead of hours, such a craft was owned by the daughter of the head of the company, Bulma Briefs, a highly intelligent woman and close friends with Goki. The woman she spotted outside the hovercraft's window. As Bulma spotted her downed friend she made her way towards the ground for a landing only for one of her passengers to speak up. Um, be Bulma. We might want to. Oh, I don't know. Fly the other way. Bulma scoffed at such an idea. What? Why on earth would we do that when we flew all this way, huh? Do you like wasting my gas and time? No, no, of course not, the bold young lady responded, trying her damnedest not to let her fearful stammer take control of her. I it's just I think Goki's sister is still standing and I would prefer to not get my head caved in this time, said passenger began to twiddle her thumbs in an anxious tick, hoping that her plead would possibly be heeded by her companion, a foolish hope to be sure. But miss, Briefs merely brushed off such a complaint, oh hush, quit being such a coward, Krillin. Who knows, maybe they found a way to resolve this non-violently. Non-violently? Bulma, are you sure you're not the one who got slapped through a building? You heard the lady, she doesn't want peace. Krillin all but blurted out as she found herself dumbfounded by her statement, for such a smart woman she has said some of the dumbest comments. Well, if you're right then we just brought two more warm bodies to help make sure her doomsday plan doesn't become a reality, said people seemed prepared for such a fight, Krillin had on her traditional orange GI with the symbol of the turtle style embroidered onto her chest as the master of said turtle style sat in the back, swaying with the motion of the ship that resided in. B. Bulma, are you trying to get me killed again? Cause, if so, I really don't appreciate it. Bulma didn't take too kindly to such an accusation, merely firing back with, Will you quit being so negative? Besides, there's no turning back now, we're landing. Said second body seemed to have enough of their idle talk and decided to take action, taking a hearty swig of his travel gourd. The old turtle hermit tossed it aside before flinging the cargo doors wide open. You two ladies can keep bickering all y'all like, I am going down there. Yaha! With little ceremony, the balded master jumped from the aircraft much to Krillin's shock. Master Roshi! She yelled as both she and Bulma made their way towards the open door to see what would happen next to the drunk old fool, could he not have waited for us to land? Well, he's got the right spirit. Why don't you join him? Bulma yelled before giving her friend a hearty push from the plane, sending Krillin reeling backward towards her exit. Bulma, what on earth are you? Wah! Before Krillin could even gain her balance back she felt a gust of wind pull her from the plane, sending her plummeting to the ground below just like her master. Why Bulma why? Fly, you bonehead. Bulma remarked, right, fly. Jay just fly. Ha ha. I can't believe I forgot I cool Krillin mumbled to herself, preparing to slow her descent with her ability of flight only to feel her body collide with another mass, one that was firm but not as firm as the ground below. Looking behind her she found herself lost in a sea of ocean blue eyes as a man with a mane of blonde hair and a perfect smile cradled her as if she was his newlywed. Um, hello there. Are you two all right? W wa ah. She squealed as she realized that she wasn't floating by her own power but was actually in the arms of a lean, muscular, hunk. Looking around she found that this mysterious stranger had her in his arms while his other was extended, gripping her master's drunken self by his ankle, leaving him hanging for dear life. W w who on earth are you? Oh. Well that's strange. I was going to ask you the same question. 
It's not every day an angel falls from heaven, he cooed rather playfully, much to the embarrassment of Krillin. Her face changed from a timid pink to a crimson red, her small frame was covered in her blush as she tried to formulate coherent sentences which, in and of itself, was an ordeal. KKK Krill, KK Krill. Krill, huh? I swear. This dimension has some interesting names. I think I might like my stay, he said with a smile, especially if more angels fall into my arms. He ha ha ha. Ladies man, I like it. He he he. The drunkard blabbed, his head still spinning from his previous decisions. Though, hanging upside down would also cause your head to feel a little out of it. And you, sir, what's your name? Sir? Boy, you best know who you're talking to. I am the great master Roshi. The turtle hermit. He yelled in protest, roaring his title to the heavens and back so that all would hear him. Naruto merely chuckled, humoring the poor old man as he answered back, Are you sure you're not the great drunken hermit? Drunk? Ha! Huh. You ain't seen anything yet. He he ha ha ha. The man replied as he went to reach for his gourd only to find it strangely missing. Allowing the aged man to fumble around for his booze, Naruto turned to greet his supposed angel, raising a brow to her before breaching a question, a friend of yours? H. Hum. She asked, unaware of how long she was staring at the man in question, somehow she found herself slightly entranced in his features from his eyes to his features to even the strange whisker-like markings on his cheeks, he seemed to be a mystery she would be more than willing to solve. Oh oh, him? Yes, H. He's my master. Is he always this drunk? Krillin shook her head adamantly, and no. I it's just, he was kinda scared coming over here so he kinda. Ah, liquid courage. He answered for her before wiggling the old man by his ankle, it's alright, some people fight better drunk, eh, turtle hermit? Haha. Ha. I like your style kid. And now, can ya put me down please, and my stomach ain't f feelin' to hot. With that, Naruto lowered himself to the wasteland below releasing the hermit so he could empty his stomach into a nearby bush and allowing the short little angel out of his embrace, something she seemed a bit hesitant to give up, as he touched down, so did the hovercraft the two came from, allowing a blue-haired young woman to make herself known as she flung open the side door of her craft and produced a strange-looking weapon that was foreign to most standing in the field. A hey, all right you clowns, no sudden movements if you know what's good for ya. This thing is locked and loaded and I am not afraid to use it, she yelled cocking back the hammer before taking aim directly towards her first target, Raditsa. The newly named Jain didn't seem to take kindly to such a weapon being drawn on her, keep pointing that weapon at me and it'll rip your, ah. But her objection seemed to be cut short by her master's brand searing itself against her flesh once more. Easy now Jain or your temper will be your undoing, he stated sternly, turning this once raging Saiyan warrior to a docile observer. W what the? Bulma wondered before she found herself piecing together the puzzle before her, now turning her weapon towards the blonde that stood in her way. Oh, so you must be the brains of the operations. You sent Radtiza here to wipe out all life on Earth, huh? Well, we won't go down without a fight. Hum. What? No, no, no. That's not it at all, Naruto said, hoping to de-escalate the problem only to find himself having to catch a bullet from midair to keep it from colliding with his forehead. Bulma. Bulma. Take it easy. Goki spoke, trying to find enough energy to stand only to find herself propping herself up onto one knee. H he's with us. Huh. How? Goki sighed. Well, W without him, I, I probably wouldn't be here right now. If he hadn't appeared out of the blue, your friend would have had an extra hole in her chest. Another chimed in, a voice that seemed to bring shivers down the spine of most of those who stood within earshot, something I wouldn't have been too torn up about. P. Piccolo. You're alive. Bulma screamed, turning her firearm towards the green demon. Humph. If you think I would have been done in so easily, you have another thing coming, he responded dismissively, finding the threat she posed with such a simple weapon wasn't worth his time, electing to turn his attention towards the man before him, and as for our new guest, I have a few questions for him. All of these questions can be answered later, right now I wish to tend to the injured, you being no exception, he said preparing to help him only to be dismissed. Me? Ha, huh, I've dealt with worse, he chuckled before his left side started to flex and he released a hefty scream before another arm was regrown from the stump of the old one, I'd rather die than accept help for something so minor. Naruto merely responded with laughter, ha ha, fair enough. 
before he turned his attention back to those who truly needed him. Now, Goki, let's get you fixed up. And no, I am fine, really. I heard dismissal of his help was quickly cut as he brought his palm to her chest once more to heal what was needed. That's enough. Broken ribs are nothing to scoff at. Now, sit and take your medicine, all right? All Goki could do was respond with a meek, F fine, before allowing his energy to overcome her. M mama. Or why you gonna be, A all right? Gohan questioned from her lap, which got a smile from her in return. The mother ran her fingers through her daughter's wild hair as she soothed her with her words, Gohan, it's okay. Mama's going to be fine. She's right, nothing dire here, she's just too stubborn for her own good. Naruto retorted, getting a giggle from the little one. Now, this is only a quick fix, even after eons of time spent to study it, I've never been an expert of medical ninjutsu so this will reset your broken ribs but with too much strain the can re-snap, so, I must ask for you to take it easy for the next couple of days, he spoke with authority, however, it seemed to have a more playful demeanor about it than a forceful one, which is why Goki seemed to agree with his decree, something that anyone who knew Goki would be surprised by. As the newcomers looked on in surprise to see how easy this mysterious stranger had talked Goki, the most stubborn-headed fools they've ever met, into agreeing to a few days of bed rest they only had one thought coursing through their minds. The came house was now the conversion point for all parties involved after such a hellish day as both friends and enemies and unknown rested under the same roof. On the second floor rested Goki and her daughter, taking a much needed rest from their ordeal while the newly introduced Naruto sat next to them, healing them as much as he could while getting some sleep himself. On the ground floor sat the rest, Bulma and Krillin found themselves next to the stairs, trying to keep as much distance as possible from the other two that occupied the room, Piccolo who leaned himself against the kitchen bar and Jine who took a sitting position on the couch. Each individual that sat downstairs seemed to continuously eye up one another, some out of timid fear and others out of curiosity. Krillin was definitely the former. Hey, are you sure we should let her, ya yeah, no, in the house? Trust me. I am just as concerned as you but, that blonde guy said she's under his control now, meaning she won't do anything against his word. So, Bulma trailed off as she saw Jine twitch from the mention of her newly made master but she seemed to go back to her usual scowl before long. And you're just gonna believe him? Krillin asked, questioning whether or not this man could even be trusted with such a lofty statement seeing as she was the first one to feel Jine's wrath when she arrived here on Kami House. Bulma merely shrugged and simply responded with, Well, so far he hasn't done anything to cause me to distrust him, hell, he's done more for our group than most today. Krillin concedes that point, even though she wasn't there to witness this supposed seal bonding the blonde spoke of she can tell that Jine is far more controlled and docile than she was a few hours prior so he can't be completely lying, fine, it'll give you that but why on God's green earth did we let Piccolo back here? Raditza is on a short leash, fine, but him, there's nothing keeping him from trying to blow us to oblivion. For a group trying to speak covertly, you're doing a terrible job at it, Piccolo interjected causing the two unsuspecting humans to jump. I said this before, I have my own reasons for staying here, questions that need answering, until that point, I won't be leaving. The green creature confirmed before a twisted grin slipped across his features, if you have a problem with that, come, make me leave. And no, of course not. Make yourself at home, Bulma cooed, shuffling behind her friend Krillin in a vain attempt to keep herself safe, much to Krillin's chagrin. Hey, this ain't your house. Bulma. Don't you be offering it up to people. Master Roshi hissed from the bathroom as another dry heave rocked his body with a vicious shiver. Oh oh god. Oh my s stomach is doing flips. T that's my master, huh? Krillin sighed. How on earth did I get myself into this mess today? Ha ha ha. Jine chuckled, unnerving those that reside in Kame House. Watching this scene is the best entertainment I've had since I've been here. It's all just so pathetic. She cooed whipping a tear from her eyes in a vain attempt to compose herself from her laughing fit. Insulted by such a statement Bulma went on the offensive by launching a rather hefty retort towards the black-haired Saiyan, who are you calling pathetic, you flea-ridden monkey? At least I am not a puppet on a string like you. Bulma yelled before shooting Jine a sneering grin, I don't know about you but I de call that majorly pathetic. B Bulma, don't oh, will you relax, Krillin, what's she going to do? Stare us to death. The mystery man specifically said she is to sit there and do nothing until he says so. We're fine, however, as she chuckled over her previous statement she. 
along with Krillin and Piccolo, began to feel an unholy aura fill the room emanating from one, in particular, Gina, arms folded tightly against her armored chest, Gina glared daggers towards the group, Bulma in particular, as she grinded her teeth in frustration, if not for her lord's orders she would have painted this building with the woman's guts but, she was merely relegated to fuming against them with a flare of her power. Gina. A voice called from the second floor, immediately snapping the long-haired Saiyan from her fuming, if you wish to throw a tantrum then take it outside, I will not allow you to make our hosts feel uncomfortable in their own home. V very well, master, Gina squeaked out as her hardened warrior demeanor broke, making her seem to be a whimpering grunt under the order of this mysterious new visitor, in one swift motion the now royally embarrassed Gina stood and left the building, releasing a gruesome screech. W well then, that was, interesting, Bulma sighed, brazing herself against the railing of the stairs in hopes of keeping her right side up, Krillin, I am going to try and help Master Roshi settle his stomach, mind checking up on Goki and our new guests. H hey, Sure she murmured making her way up to where the mysterious stranger and her childhood friend disappeared to, you um, mister, you still in there? Krillin hummed, poking her head into one of the only rooms in the second story of the famed came house to find a somewhat wholesome sight. Atop a floor mattress laid her friend Goki with her child tucked tenderly next to her, cuddling deeper into her mother's bosom for warmth and comfort, sitting next to said mattress was this mysterious individual, levitating about five inches of the ground with his legs crossed and his arms folded over his muscular chest, he seemed to be in some form of deep thought or trance indicated by his shut eyes and seeming obliviousness to the bald intruder. With little to go on from what she could see Krillin lets herself in, taking a few hesitant steps in before scanning the area for anything suspicious, I can't be too careful with this guy, she thought, she appreciated his efforts in stopping Jain's plan of world destruction and from what little she's seen he seems to be a nice man but from what she was told he's a completely unknown factor to everyone involved. Welcome Krill, he spoke up, his previously closed eyes were now peering over his shoulder directly at her, he smiled before motioning for her to come in, come now, don't be shy, I've been needing someone to talk to since Goki and Gohan passed out. All right, she stammered making her way to the opposite side of the floor mat Goki resided on. Sorry if I disturbed you. Hum. Oh, of course not. I was actually trying to catch up on a little sleep myself before I felt you coming, he chuckled. So, I am guessing you're here about your friend's health status, huh? With a simple nod from Krillin, Naruto continued. At the moment she's doing just fine. All of her major wounds like her two broken ribs and her cracked three vertebrae in her lumbar region were easily healed. All she needs now is rest, much to her dismay. Krillin was surprised to say the least. W wow and you fixed all of that by yourself? Well, of course, I was the only one in the room. What, do you think I have a second person hidden under my cloaks? He asked with a knowing smirk but Krillin seemed to mistake his humor for a genuine question. What? No, of course, not, it's just... Something like that usually requires her to be in the hospital for a week or two at the most but you seem to be able to heal her in the fraction of the time. You're almost like a walking senzu bean, she said, causing Naruto to cock a brow from such a strange statement. A walking what now? He asked only for Krillin to shake her head in response. I it's a long story, I'll tell you about them later, she said, knowing that having to explain such a magical bean to an outsider would take far more time than she would like to give right now, so... How on earth did you manage to heal her so quickly? Simple, I've learned a few medical jutsus in my time, though even with a few generations of training I'd call myself more of an amateur at it, I am not Tsunade or Sakura-chan, that's for sure, he responded, recalling the many, many times he tried to learn the more highly skilled medical jutsus only to find himself overhealing or replenishing cells that weren't dead leading to a strange bulge on the wound site. Once the memory faded he noticed Krillin's perplexed look, what? What's a jutsu? She asked, genuinely confused as to what this blonde was talking about. Why you're joking, right? Not in the slightest, Krillin fired back, catching Naruto by surprise. Oh boy. Now you're calling on my memory, let's see, how would I explain it properly, he asked, tapping his chin in thought. Jutsus, are used as techniques by those of us who can tap into our body's natural reserves of chakra. Once more Krillin looked at him with a puzzled expression causing him to ask, what now? Well, what's chakra? Now Naruto was truly confused, you're kidding, every living thing has it. I hate to break it to you but I think you're a bit confused, said Krillin, 
It's key you're referring to, not chakra. Every living and breathing creature on this planet inhabits a spirit that can be molded and used to form key attacks. Naruto seemed to pause after her quick explanation of this supposed key before he began to laugh, hee hee ha ha. W what? Did I say something funny to you? Krillin asked, her cheeks now dusted with red as she felt his laughter was targeted towards her. As his chuckling began to die down he explained himself, and no, no, it's just I can't help but chuckle at my own stupidity sometimes, after all. What kind of fool would think that in another dimension that they would have the same body chemistry, let alone sources of strength? W what? The more Naruto seemed to speak the more lost Krillin became as she found herself baffled by what he just said, another dimension. You can't be serious. Of course I am. Did that green fellow not tell you how I arrived? Nor Jine? He inquired. He had hoped that either of the two had possible filled them in but if he had given it some thought he should have known that was a fool's assumption. Krillin's voice turned a bit sour as she responded to his question. Well, the green guy and I aren't exactly on speaking terms. Ah, a lover's quarrel perhaps? He asked, giving her a knowing nod as if he could see through her coy facade. H huh. Don't joke about something like that. I would never fall for a pointed-eared demon like that, not after what he did. He could tell he hit a nerve within her. Her eyes seemed to be filled with aggression and fear that seemed to come from years of animosity. He's a monster who's vowed to kill Goki and her friends countless times. The only reason he showed up on the battlefield today was to aid Goki in taking out a bigger foe than either of them could take on alone. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, huh? Now that I think of it I should have guessed the tense atmosphere wasn't merely between Goki and Jine. But back to the matter at hand, Naruto replied as he let the tension in the room fade before he continued, The reason I intervened in your friend's battle was by complete accident, you see, I just came from my dimension and it would seem that I so happened to pick a worse place to put my external rift, walking straight into that green fellow's attack meant for Jine. You can't say something so incomprehensible as that so casually, she said as her mind tried to comprehend what exactly he said and how on earth that could be possible, what exactly do you mean you just came from your dimension? It's exactly as I described, I came from my dimension to yours, using a technique that took me about three decades to actually understand let alone master I was able to forcefully punch a hole through space and time to allow me to traverse other dimensions, he said rather matter-of-factly as if it was such a simple concept to grasp. Oh other, you mean there's more? An infinite amount actually, each being separated by space and time, he responded, I've been to quite a few of them in my day but this one has the biggest difference I've seen so far. What do you mean by that? Well, I've come across quite a few that were eerily similar to my own dimension but with a few changes, parallel dimensions with superficial or historical shifts, others have been merely bare, worlds covered in sand or stripped into a cavernous sheet of dirt and mud, but this one, this was the first I could find that actually was completely different from my world, your people, your aura, everything. It's quite interesting to say the least, he said with such excitement. It would seem like finding their world was a major discovery for him, something that he has yet to discover in his long life. I suppose that's why I was shocked that you didn't know what chakra was. Krillin vaguely nodded. Okay but, why you still haven't answered my question? I didn't? How so? I thought I was pretty Thoru how did you jump from dimensions? She howled but, surprisingly, didn't wake up the duo resting mere inches from her. In fact, they have yet to stare this entire time of their discussion. If Krillin wasn't so engrossed by this talk she might have questioned it. Once the question was asked it seemed that the blonde stranger grew rather serious. His simple smile was replaced with a hard line and his eyes shifted to his lap, unable to bring himself to look Krillin in the eyes while he spoke on the coming matter. It's quite a long story and someday I might tell it but for now I'll merely say I sacrificed quite a bit. Within that sacrifice I gained abilities and power far beyond those around me. One of these abilities allowed me to leave a dimension I have grown out of and into yours, he spoke, his voice soft yet carried a harsh sadness to it, something that dug deep into Krillin's moral center, she wasn't a cruel person, she's aware the things a human can endure and suffer through to protect those they care for and it seems like this mysterious stranger has had more than enough of that. I think I am being a bit too brash with him, she thought, toying with the hem of her GI out of a nervous habit, prepared to speak only to find any ER words halted by another's abrupt entrance. Master! yelled Jine, barging through the bedroom door in a panic, a distinct lack of scouter perched on her left ear. We have a problem, a big one. Hum. Wah? What's going on here? Goki mumbled, 
lifting from her slumber with her child cradled in her left arm while she used the right to rub the crust from her eyes, said child was also slowly stirring. The headache she once had now fully vanished thanks to our blonde stranger, a man who seemed quite as nice as her father was, or rather, what she believed. Oh, hey Krillin, when did you get here? Have you been watching me while I sleep again? Hey again? Yeah, you used to do that when we were key. Silence. This isn't time for your insistent small talk. This is a matter of utmost importance. Jine yelled before dropping the shattered remains of her scouter on the floor. The Saiyans are coming. Five minutes prior asterisk double Sunday. Jine roared, firing off her dual pink lasers from her palms, carving its way through the ocean blue to reveal its sandy base before returning to being submerged once more. She let out a sigh, releasing the tension built in her muscles as her thoughts began to spin. Damn it rat it. Gee Jine, I can't believe this is what we've come to. Once a powerful warrior that carved her way through the galaxy now forced to play nice with lesser beings. Not only that but you've signed away your life yet again. First to that tyrant Frieza and now to this stranger you know nothing of, and what for? Your life. Bah. What life is there left to live now? Oi, monkey. Are you done throwing a tantrum? A voice called to her, pulling her from her self-center loathing back to reality, turning. She found that the one who mocked her was the only one where who would have the courage to do so. Piccolo, is that a yes? Careful, green bean. Push me and it'll make you regret it, she remarked curtly, turning her attention back to the rippling waves of the ocean, her long black hair blowing in the breeze. Now, if you need something then speak up, if not then drop dead. Piccolo shrugged off her supposed threat and did what he came here to do. Humph, very well. I wasn't privy to your encounter with Son Goki before I arrived so I wanted to know exactly why you came here. That's all. Very well. Listen up Greeny, I despise having to repeat myself, Jine said as she watched the ocean return to its calming waves, Goki or rather, Kakarot, was sent to this miserable planet for one goal and one goal alone. The complete destruction of the inhabitants of this world, Piccolo interrupted, much to Jine's aggravation, she informed me of that little tidbit. Well then. That saves me some time explaining, she responded rather curtly before continuing, during Kakarot's absence myself and the remaining Saiyans have pledged ourselves to a galactic tyrant named Lord Frieza. Being the lapdog for such a being was despicable but we had little choice, until now, through our conquest and battles we've grown beyond anything we dreamed of, our power levels combined could topple our oppressor and allow us to take control of his empire. But we wished to be sure of our victory so I was tasked with bringing back my sister if she survived, however. When I arrived I found her here, alive and well along with the rest of this world's population. I wished to see if she could even be a part of our coop so I tasked her with killing 100 humans within the hour and now, as you can see, I couldn't even trust her to do that. Piccolo seemed to find something funny as he began to chuckle, so, that's what this was all about, your own little coop in the stars, how humorous. What's so funny, vermin? That if it weren't for him you and Goki would have been nothing more than the dust under my boot. Jine hissed, more than willing to drive her point home if she wasn't bound by such a foolish seal. Funny, I remember events a bit differently, you mere seconds away from having a hole drilled into you and your sister's chests, ridding this universe of you and giving me a few peaceful months without Goki. Piccolo didn't seem all that fearful of Jine's hollow threats, it seems that knowing she is all bark and no bite really did help keep her monstrous aura from affecting him as much as others. Jine cocked her brow to something the green creature said, months? What are you on about now? Unless Kakarot has some ability I am unaware of I don't think she'll be coming back. Fool. Son Goki would never be dead for long, he answered with a half-hearted snicker. The seven dragon balls, my friend, they can grant any wish, even bring people back from the dead, it wouldn't be long before Goki's friends gathered them and wished her back. The seven dragon balls, huh? And you said they can grant any wish? This was news to her, rather interesting news in fact. Something that powerful could do quite a lot, possibly even break a binding contract. Mostly, I could tell you more about them but I am afraid I don't have the patience to explain it, though the ins and outs of the Dragon Balls weren't terribly detailed Piccolo knew explaining too much to this unknown extraterrestrial wouldn't be wise. Of course you would say something like that, Ubasta Jine began only for an audible beep ring through her scouter, looking to the text in the farthest left hand corner of her scouter she was struck silent by the words displayed on it. Daily transmission sent. Scouter number 275 disconnected. 
Scouter number 276 disconnected Jine's blood ran cold as a bead of sweat rushed down her face, and then no. Oh God. What now? Piccolo asked though his tone seemed to turn when he noticed how distraught Jine seemed. Hey, what's wrong? God damn it. She yelled, ripping the scouter from the side of her head before scrunching it within her palm. They know, they know everything now. Who is they, Jine? Piccolo yelled back hoping to get some form of response that was vague. The Saiyans I told you about. They were listening in our battle and our conversations this whole time. They know of my loss to you, my bondage to him and now, t they even know about the Dragon Balls, she responded as her rage soon seemed to twist into fear. This didn't sit well with Piccolo. W what, but how? During missions each team with a scouter syncs to the same frequency, allowing us to talk or transmit our audio recording to one another. They used my link to their scouters to eavesdrop on me. They've probably been spying on me ever since I landed. Those, tt those bastards. You could tell this hurt her in a fundamental way, such an utter invasion of privacy was one thing but knowing that both of her comrades in arms know of her loss was even more sickening, no doubt they're already heading this way as we speak. I am guessing to end you for defecting, humph, maybe, but that's not the sole reason for them coming over. If I know them well enough they'll be aiming to snatch a wish from those Dragon Balls you told me about, retorted Jine, she knew all too well that their number one objective would be to snatch up those Dragon Balls and her death would be seen as more of a bonus than a goal they must reach. How long? Based on their last known quadrants, they'll be here in one Earth year. Hum, this is quite interesting, Naruto hummed before he stroked his chin as if he was a wise bearded sensei, seemingly indifferent to what exactly his subordinate had informed him of. Goki, however, had a different response, now fully awakened from her slumber she jumped to her feet and quickly responded with, more fighters are coming here as we speak? Amazing. Are they as strong as you? She cooed as she picked up her daughter who still seemed to be fast asleep even after her mother's loud response. Stronger. Much more in fact. Jine answered though it seemed to burn her to have to admit that. Wipe that damn look off your face, Kakarot, don't you get it? You could barely handle me with help. How on earth do you think you'll even come close to defeating them? Goki seemed to take her sister's aggression with stride as she merely responded with a bubbly retort. Well, training of course, I gotta start right now if I am. You idiot. Weighted clothing and shadow boxing want to you a damn bit of good against Vega and Nappa. You along with this pitiful planet will be vaporized. Jine yelled, stopping Goki's feeble rationalization before it could continue. I think that's enough, Jine. Naruto spoke softly in hopes of snapping her out of her downward spiral, I believe we are all aware of the situation at hand. I don't think you are, Jine responded though this time with a bit more control than before it would seem like the seal Naruto placed on her could even help with her emotional state, Jine couldn't tell if that was a good thing or another annoyance to add to the pile. However, their back and forth was interrupted by someone's call from downstairs, you um, hey guys, you better get down here, Bulma's nervously shouted. TT there's this genie looking guy on a magic carpet. A genie? Man, this world is full of possibilities, he said joyfully as he released his levitation, allowing his feet to touch down on solid ground. Well, let's not leave the genie waiting. Maybe he's here to grant someone's wish. And with that, Naruto was down the stairs followed by Jine who was compelled by both an urge to keep close to her supposed master and curiosity of this supposed genie as one by one made their way from Kami House to his beachfront exterior they were greeted to a sight that most errant privy to. Standing atop a decorative carpet that wiggled under his feet stood a short yet plum figure, his skin as dark as coal with large beady eyes, red lips and sharp, pointy ears, his head was adorned with a stark white turban with an aqua-colored gem, his attire consisted of a maroon-colored, gold-trimmed vest matched with baggy white pants and a large red sash acting as a belt, hello there, my name is Miz. Mr. Popo, it's really you? Goki remarked with a chuckle, being the first to rush towards the small, rotund figure with zero hesitation. What are you doing here? I am here for you, Goki. Kami would like an audience with you, was Popo's response as he motioned towards the east, supposedly in the direction of this Kami he spoke off. You can meet God here too. Naruto all but shrieked in childlike glee, something that confused most of those who saw it, especially Jine. Amazing. Magic carpets, genies and a meeting with an actual god. This is a fantastic dimension. Popo took notice of this outburst and directed an inquisitive stare towards him. Hello, who exactly are you? 
Oh, apologize. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. It's a pleasure to meet you Genie san Naruto said, making his way towards Mr. Popo with his hand outstretched for a proper handshake. Mr. Popo took his hand in his and shook it rather loosely, almost as if he knew of the gesture but cared not to do it properly. Likewise Uzumaki-san but I am no genie, he said, shattering Naruto's childlike illusion he had of him. Oh, then what exactly are you? Naruto asked, which Mr. Popo was more than willing to answer. I am the assistant to Kami on the lookout tower and at the moment I have a very important job to complete. His tone gave the impression of being pleased with his title of assistant and why wouldn't he? Naruto thought, being the assistant to a god must be quite an honor. Mr. Popo. Why does Kami need to see me? Goki asked, trying her best to get back to the reason Mr. Popo made the trip in the first place. It has to deal with the coming threat the Saiyans pose, that was all he informed me of. Jain was the next to derail this meeting of the minds as she pushed through the small crowd to voice her opinion. Impossible. How would someone already know of such a thing happening? I just learned about it moments ago. Do not presume that you and Kami are on the same level in terms of foresight. His tone seemed to be offended by such a question but Popo's blank features didn't change at all as he switched back to the task at hand. Now Goki, hop on my carpet. We don't have much time. All right. Let's do this. She said. Hopping aboard the carpet with gusto as Gohan, now awakened from her slumber but this strange turn of events, gripping her G.I. in childlike fear of the unknown, don't worry guys, I'll tell you everything when I get back. Don't worry Goki. Well see you there, Naruto said with a knowing smirk. Who? The lookout tower, Popo hummed softly as he and the sun duo swiftly disappeared near instantaneously, leaving the remaining Z fighters awestruck. Man, that thing sure can go. Naruto whistled, looking into the distance as he could still see the trio flying through the sky at near instantaneous speeds as clear as the day was bright. He then turned his attention to those who remained on the beach as he gripped a corner of his cloak, offering it to whoever was prepared to take it. All right, those who wish to head to this lookout, grab hold. The remaining Z fighters seemed to be confused by what Naruto meant which wasn't surprising. I prefer not to exert myself when I don't need to, so I placed a simple seal tag on the back of Goki. With that I can teleport to wherever she may be in this dimension, he said, lifting his hand to reveal a glowing seal on his palm that read flying Ragin in a yellow hue, so, grab hold if you wish to come. Not one second after Mr. Popo's magic carpet vanished did it appear above the clouds. Hovering inches from the tiled floor of the lookout, a please very few could ever make it to let alone walk upon. Goki is a lucky woman. This will be her third time arriving on this hallowed place, the one being the easiest trip yet. Hopping from her ride she runs her fingers through her poor sweetheart's hair, seeing as the trip frightened him half to death, it's okay little one, it's alright, she cooed softly, her rhythmic voice calming the girl ever so slightly. Goki, Kami is waiting for you in the awe. Popo began but was silenced when a flash of bright, yellow light blinded him for a moment, giving way to the supposed crew they had just left behind seconds prior except for Bulma and Master Roshi, said crew was now laying on the marble tiles of the lookout. Naruto excluded, as each tried to find their bearing after such a swift trip. Oh 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 god. My organs feel like they were just jumbled up. Krillin hissed, covering her mouth to hopefully keep her lunch down. Damn you. How about you warn us next time that trick of yours has a side effect or two? Piccolo snarled, him being one of the only few that could actually keep on his feet after such an ability, but that's not to say he was left unscathed. Jine, on the other hand, was using her master's shoulder as a Cedo crutch, leaning heavily on him in order to keep herself from the floor. Leaning forward, she exhaled the contents of her stomach onto the lookout floor with a sickening lurch, much to the dismay of Mr. Popo. I, I wish, I could have stayed where I was. Sorry everyone. I guess I should have added that little caveat to my description. Naruto said though everyone could tell he only half-heartedly meant it, though, to be fair, back in my dimension no one really complained all that much about it. Hey. How did you all get her Goki began only for Mr. Popo to cut their little reunion short. We can speak of this later, it's best not to keep Kami waiting, Popo said, snatching Goki by the wrist as he pulled her towards the lookout. As the two moved forward Mr. Popo noticed a particular individual tailing them, his arms tucked behind his back as if he didn't have a care to his name. Excuse me but this meeting doesn't concern you, I'll have to ask you to. Naruto didn't seem to notice the urgency Mr. Popo was in and exclaimed. Oh come now Mr. Popo, 
Don't be like that, I've always wanted to meet God. You may have your audience with him later, he told me specifically that this offer was for Goki and Goki alone, now please Lee. A voice seemed to silence their interaction, Mr. Popo. Please, don't be so rude to our guests, said voice emerged from the walkway that trailed into the main portion of the lookout tower. The voice came from a figure that had a shocking resemblance to Piccolo with about fifty years added, leaving his skin wrinkled and his posture hunched, his clothing was a simple white robe with a red symbol that rested on his chest that translated to God in a blue-collared cape to top it all off. Ah! I thought I sensed a familiar power out here, it is good to see you again, Piccolo, the man must as he pointed his twisted cane towards his younger-looking counterpart. The green creature merely hissed at Kami before responding, Humph, old man. How's the limp? As incorrigible as always, Kami shook his head, seemingly disappointed in his response, but it didn't seem to last as he looked towards the newest face on his lookout, Naruto. Now you, on the other hand, have grabbed my attention. I've only been able to sense your presence for about three hours now. Before this, I have never felt such a presence like yours on this planet. Why exactly is that? Are you an extraterrestrial? I am. Not exactly sure what that means, but I'll tell you this. I am definitely not from around here, Naruto said with a chuckle and a scratch of his whiskered cheek. Hello. My name is Naruto Uzumaki and it is a pleasure to meet you Kami, though, if I can be frank for a moment, you're not exactly how I thought you would look like. Kami seemed more than a bit confused by Naruto's question, hum? What exactly do you mean by that? Naruto was more than willing to explain himself. Well, when I was a young boy I was told that Kami was a being of pure light bathed in heavenly robes of silk and velvet and beside him would be his other half, Yami, though I mean no disrespect when I say that, the more he explained the wider Kami's eyes seemed to go. I I believe you have me confused with someone else, Uzumaki-san, Kami said in a simple tone, something that betrayed a patient individual, I am the guardian of this world and I wear such a title with pride. Guardian of this world, huh, interesting, once more Naruto added something else to his interesting file before continuing. So then, you must be the most powerful being on this planet. Ha! Huh, laughed Piccolo, finally catching his bearings after the swift transport, he could barely handle me a year ago, his strongest technique is to lock someone up in a damn jar. Careful Piccolo or I will acquaint you with said jar again. This threat from Kami seemed to hit a nerve in his counterpart as he was preparing to storm his way towards him with reckless abandon. Try me. You wrinkled OL enough. Quit wasting my time, Jine yelled pulling Piccolo back before pointing a demanding finger towards Kami, you, your blackened servant spoke of you having a way to deal with the coming invasion, yes? Ah yes, I do, King Yama has given me his blessing to take one mortal and one mortal alone who is pure of heart with me to the afterlife for training, there you shall travel down Snake Way, a nearly endless pathway that, if you're brave enough to truly traverse, is home to a legendary being known as King Kai, he shall be your teacher. Goki's eyes lit up, wow. That sounds amazing. You can't be serious. Jine didn't share her sister's bubbly sentiment. Training. That is all you have? These Saiyans have been wiping out planets from orbit since they took their first steps but you think mere training will get Kakarot up to par? Am I the only one who understands the danger we're facing? King Kai is far beyond any of you in terms of wisdom and strength. Without his tutelage this planet and those on it are doomed. You may feel like such training isn't enough but unless you have another plan this is our best option. Kami seemed more than prepared to fire back against Jain, causing her to only stammer. Kami wasn't the only one who wanted an answer, well Jain. If you have another plan then say it, Naruto asked. Jain didn't seem to have an answer as she merely folded, fine, I suppose you're right, so, when do we leave? Did you not hear me? Only one can go, one pure of heart, Kami said and, judging by his tone, he didn't care much for Jine or her disrespectful attitude towards him or such a monumental announcement. Pure of, who cares about that? Jine hissed King Yama was specific in the fact that only those deemed worthy by myself could use his pass and I desire to pick someone who is selfless and as pure of heart, Goki, that would be you. Kami looked to Goki as he finished his statement, ignoring Jine's deadly glare for the time being. No way, I get to train with this Kinkai. This sounds too good to be true. Goki cheered, almost dancing in place at the prospect of such a powerful being willing to train her in his sacred arts, training, along with her daughter, was her greatest love in this world. The idea of being stronger to not only protect her loved ones but to also battle tough opponents made her burn with passion and desire. 
she couldn't wait for such an opportunity. I take it that is a yes from you, Goki. However, when she heard Kami ask her that she felt something deep within herself delay her response. She paused, gazing down towards her offspring, her head now resting against her chest as she slipped back into a peaceful sleep at the rhythmic beat of her heart, T that. I am not sure of yet, she hummed softly, my daughter, shed have to stay, right? Hi, Kami answered somberly, if anyone should go, it would have to be you, Goki, your planet is counting on you. H hi, I I know, but, she counting on me too, she cooed, brushing a strand of hair from her daughter's face, she's been with me ever since she was born, she hasn't even left the house without me, I I can't just. Jine's blood seemed to be boiling at this point at her sister's foolish attachment to her child, their mother and father would be ashamed, and you would put this entire world at risk just because of your matern? Silence. Naruto spoke, causing a dim red glow to appear around Jine's seal and within seconds her mouth was unable to form words or even sounds, leaving her mute until her master wished her not to be, to a parent. Once they've given birth their child is their world. I understand this burden more than anyone, the one to be a parent or to be a hero to your world. Goki lightly smiled at that, you have kids? He responded with a simple, had, but such a small statement rang harshly in Goki's core. What would you do? During their younger years, I was forced to make hard decisions in order to protect them. These decisions lead me to see them less and less until I was almost a stranger to them when they were teenagers, his features matched his tone, soft yet a hardened ting to it that indicated the feeling of sadness that he must feel retelling this, if I could do it all over again, I would still do what I did. Why? Goki probably knew the answer but she needed to hear it from someone who could sympathize with her position right now. Because without my sacrifice they, along with the world they inhabited, would be no more, but don't get the wrong idea, it wasn't an easy choice. She processed what he said, she knew he was right. Everyone on this planet was a target by this Saiyan, her daughter was no exception but even if she could leave what would happen to her? She has no one else. Does she not have a father? Naruto asked not anymore, she responded her features scrunching at the mention of the girl's father. I am sorry for that, he expressed before pointing to Krillin, your friends at the Kame house would be more than willing to watch over little Gohan, she will be in safe hands. I can't do that to them, Bulma has an entire corporation to watch over, Krillin and the others will probably be training just as hard as I am for what's to come and Master Roshi, no offense, but I wouldn't feel too comfortable in leaving Gohan with him, from what Naruto has seen. He understands her objection with that but now it limits her even more for year-long babysitters. I see, he hummed, taking a moment to think of the options. Kami and Mr. Popo seem to be quite busy at being the guardians of this planet. Piccolo would be one of the worst people to abandon your kid with, seconded only to Jine who, at the moment, seems to think dropping your child for a year into a ditch so you can train is not only a good idea but the best one right now, so, with a heavy sigh, Naruto came to the only conclusion he could come to with the info he has, Goki-san. I know this might feel sudden but, would you wish for me to watch over little Gohan until you return? She was surprised to say the least. A complete stranger would be willing to watch over Gohan for an entire year. That's quite an undertaking, something that many people would need some time to think about but he seemed to be willing to do it on the spot, you? No, I couldn't ask a stranger to do something like that for me. Well, you don't need to ask. I would be more than willing to do it for you and your daughter, he said somberly, giving Goki a tender smile, I would treat her like my own. Goki smiled back but, just couldn't bring herself to do something so rash, I, I am not sure about this. I understand, this situation is not ideal for anyone at the moment, however, he muttered, placing a hand on his comrade's shoulder to comfort her in this very stressful situation. I say this from experience, if you forego this opportunity, this world won't last. W what if this training won't be enough? She asked. With a chuckle, Naruto said trust me, it will. I can feel it, before both he and Goki made up their minds. Reluctantly she handed Gohan over, the child slightly dazed from the nap prior to all of this, peeking her little girl on the cheek before whispering I love you. Goki looked to Naruto with a hardened gaze, her eyes stone cold focused on her next few words. I am entrusting my daughter's livelihood to you if anything happens to her while I am gone there will be no planet, solar system or even dimension that you can hide from me, is that clear? I give you my word, not only as a man but as a parent, that I will protect her with my life, Datbeo, he declared as he bowed, showing respect for Goki and the declaration they just set in stone, now then, 
I believe someone is waiting for you. Hi, Goki said, giving both Gohan and Naruto a quick hug before making her way towards Kami. All right Kami. I've decided. Let's do this. I am glad to hear this. I know King Yama will be very pleased. Now, grab hold Kami muttered, gesturing to his shoulder which Goki latched onto. She peered one last time over her shoulder to the people waiting for her departure. With one final wave, Goki said, see ya around everybody, before vanishing in a puff of dust and smoke. And just like that Goki's gone again. Humph. I wish I could be surprised. Krillin sighed she wished she could say she was surprised by knowing Goki this is something completely up to her alley. Now, the only thing left to do was to find out what was next for those still resting on the lookout tower. So, what's next? Kami has also given me permission to extend an invitation to all Z fighters that, starting tomorrow, we will be offering training for those who wish to partake. So Krillin, if you'd like to gather your friends here tomorrow we shall begin. Mr. Popo said with a hearty smile. His demeanor definitely shifted once his assignment was completed. T training? Like, Kami style training? Krillin muttered, a bead of sweat dripping from her bald head. Goki told me about that hyperbolic time thing and I am not. Oh no, no, no. You and your friends won't be stepping foot in the hyperbolic time chamber. That's beyond your league at the moment. No, this training is especially fitted for the threat at hand. So, inform your friends and be here at 10 a. M. Sharp. I don't like to be kept waiting, and with that, Mr. Popo made his way into the palace that set upon the lookout too, leaving the remaining people to do as they pleased. A hey, alright, so I guess I am gonna be training here for the next year. Krillin found this kinda funny, even though Mr. Popo said that it was an invitation it felt more like a passive demand but seeing as the fate of the world rested on this she didn't mind it too much, so what are you going to do, Naru hey? Where did you go? Piccolo did you ah? She screamed turning to look for Piccolo only to find he had vanished as well, along with Jine, where on earth is everybody? Floating through the infinite blue sky was a black disc of sorts, a colorless, shapeless plane that flew swiftly and effortlessly through the sky like nothing and atop it was Naruto Uzumaki cradling the still slumbering child of Son Goki, Gohan. Resting behind him was his branded assistant Jine, her back placed against his with her arms folded under her chest plate, her eyes now locked onto a slowly approaching figure. He's still following us, do you want me to do something about this? Easy now, I don't think he would have followed us for this long without a purpose, let's see what he has to say, with that, the black disc floated to a halt, allowing the figure to catch up to their current position, revealing it to be none other than Piccolo. The trio sat there for a moment, trading looks between the three of them until Piccolo seemed to break the silence after eyeing up the sleeping child with a look that didn't please Naruto one bit, so, you're the baby's keeper, huh? So it would seem, Naruto said, noticing his watchful gaze on him and the child he held, is that a problem, Piccolo? What's your plan? He asked rather curtly plan. Naruto fired back rather quickly, finding the creatures questioning. For the Saiyans, what are you preparing to do for the next year? Well, I hadn't put too much thought into it, Naruto muttered, probably scout out an uninhabited field or such and make a home there, then, spend the year training Gina for what is to come. Jine didn't seem too happy with her master's nonchalant explanation, with all due respect, master but a mere year of training won't give me an edge against those two, I hate to admit this but there's a reason they are the elite class of Saiyan warriors and I am not. Well, that's because you've never trained under someone like me, my training program is nothing to sneeze at and I've been known to triple a person's skills and potential within a year if I do say so myself, he said in a rather cocky manner. A cynical snicker escaped his lips as he flashed his companion a warm smile. For a man of your strength you're oddly optimistic, fired back Piccolo with a snarky snicker. What about that child? Naruto raised a brow to this, what about her? She could be an integral part of our team when the Saiyans arrive, he remarked. She's just a kid, I don't think she's old enough to be fighting intergalactic tyrants just yet, Naruto remarked, placing a hand over Gohan's sleeping frame. You'll have plenty of hands to help you with your battle. I believe Gohan can sit this one out. You have no idea the power this child has in it, Piccolo said definitely. I watched that thing's power skyrocket from nothing to double the strength of Goki and me within a matter of seconds. If we can focus that power there's no telling what it can do. First off, her name is Gohan. I would appreciate it if you called her by such, and secondly, you may be right about her capability but a single year is not enough to train a young child for battle no matter how much you want that. 
I gave Goki my word that no harm would come to her child and I will keep it. I don't know, Naruto, on our home planet, we would be trained from the second we could walk for battle. Even if we don't use her in this particular battle I think it would be a waste of her raw talent, Jain added. You too, huh? He mumbled, scratching his cheek in contemplation. Look, both of your suggestions have been heard but I have made up my mind. Gohan will not be trained this year. Once Goki returns then she will be able to do as she pleases with her daughter. Piccolo merely hissed in disappointment. You're making a terrible mistake. That may be, but it is a mistake I am willing to make, Gohan's caretaker said, before shifting to the next point of contention. Now, will you be coming with us or? Hum. Wondered Piccolo well. I assumed you didn't just follow us this whole time just to know what I am doing with Gohan. So, would you like to join my little training camp or no? He asked, much to the shock of both Piccolo and his branded companion. Piccolo couldn't help but chuckle at such a request. Humph. Unlike Jain I don't need a coach but I can always use a few fresh targets to spar with. If I remember correctly, I was the one who took your arm. Don't make me do it again. Worm. Jain fired back with authority, much to Piccolo's chagrin. Both of you calm down, you're gonna have to learn to get used to one another, we are going to be around each other for a whole year, and with that, the growing group of four took their leave, following Piccolo's lead to a fairly secluded area that would be perfect for their year of intense training. The Great Plains well now, this has promise, Naruto hummed as he peered across the vast expanse of the plains, sand mixed with grass mixed with hills and pillars of rocks, it was quite a sight for a man who is used to simple terrain, how did you come across a place like this? I know, Jain spoke with a snicker, this is the same place I found you brooding when I arrived here, let me guess, this is where you call home. What if it is? The green demon lord barked back, eliciting a curt chuckle from the spiky haired Saiyan. Nothing, nothing at all, she hummed with a smirk, it's just, it fits. Piccolo didn't seem to take kindly to that, deciding to fire back with, mock me all you want, it matters little to me what a chained pet says. You little. Jain snarled, prepared to take this beast's head for saying such things but her master was quick to halt her attempt. That's enough, said Naruto as he dispelled his flat flying surface, allowing himself and Jain to touch the ground once more, we will be stuck with each other for a full year, I would like for us all to try our best to get along and work together, alright? Fat chance, Piccolo hissed, turning his back on the two. Not likely, Jain remarked, repeating her green counterpart's action. Well then, I must rephrase, he chuckled before he produced a clone of himself in a poof of smoke. Something that shocked everyone that stood next to him. Before gifting the clone Gohan who then walked away to find a suitable place to make camp. Once the clone was out of earshot the air around them began to grow thick and the pressure became nearly unbearable. Dropping both Jain and Piccolo to one knee, sweat dripped heavily from their face as their internals felt like they were about to burst like a balloon, it was practically unbearable. The only one who seemed to weather this storm was Naruto who only smiled a harmless grin. Now then, what I meant to say was you will find it within yourselves to get along and work together, am I understood? H hi, master. Jain whimpered, causing the aura to soften on her enough for her to stand. Piccolo didn't falter right away, he seemed to struggle against it as he shifted and strained against the unforeseen pressure before finding himself back on his knees once more. Oh okay, okay. He barked back even though he felt embarrassed at what this man had forced him to admit he would rather deal with it than be forced to stay on his knees. However, instead of releasing his pressure Naruto merely said, fantastic, before making his way towards Piccolo and placing his hand on his bare shoulder, now I think it's time for us to begin, and with that, he let Piccolo stand, every ounce of Naruto's powerful aura now nothing but a distant memory as he returned to his carefree attitude. T that aura, I've never felt anything like it. Piccolo thought as his nails dug into his palm, within a day or two he has found people that not only surpass his current standing but dwarf it, it boiled his blood to no end to see such a gap within such a short amount of time, yes, he was preparing to train with these people and he knew he would grow stronger but it didn't help to know that he was so easily grounded by mere aura. Dusting himself off Piccolo noticed something odd on his shoulder, it was some strange symbol that he's never seen before, something that he didn't seem too fond of having on him, what the hell is this? he asked, catching Naruto's attention who only seemed to chuckle. Damn, found it so soon, my stealthy skills must be growing rusty on me, he snickered, his tone seemed jovial but the implication was far from a joke. Piccolo snarled at him, tell me, now, 
It's just a simple seal duh. Take it off. Now. Piccolo interrupted, storming past Jine and snatching up Naruto's collar. I am not going to be some whipped pawn of yours. Jine signed her name away but I surely haven't signed away mine. Oh no. No. You misunderstand. Piccolo. Naruto cooed, peeling Piccolo's tight grip off of him like a simple band-aid while keeping a firm hold on his wrist. Much to the green one's dismay. If you had let me finish. This seal is to help you train. It's a simple gravity seal. I've used this seal before in my youth and I found it pretty useful. I didn't agree to have it. Piccolo retorted snatching his hand away from naruto's before going to wipe off the seal only to find it still there w what the hey i it won't come off of course not it wouldn't be an effective seal if it just rubbed clean off naruto proclaimed matter of factly as he lifted his right hand to reveal the seal he put on him just like my flying rage and seal on my left hand i can place a number of seals onto whatever i touch with a tad of chakra that fuses the ink i write with onto someone's skin it can only be washed off if i pulse my chakra over it God damn you. I don't want any type of seal you've concocted in the twisted brain of yours. Now take it off. Piccolo ordered, his eyes burning deep with a form of hatred towards this self-important bastard. Who was he to think he could brand Piccolo, the demon king? Well, I just assumed that seeing as you wanted to train with us, you'd want to train properly, Naruto said, adding fuel to Piccolo's red hot fire. I am sorry if that didn't come across, but I will remove the seal. You damn well better. If, Naruto said curtly, grinding Piccolo's self-righteousness to a sudden halt, you can take this bell from me. What? Piccolo yelled as his heavy white aura exploding from within and if Naruto and Jine were weaker people they might have shaken where they stood, the only thing to react to his explosive response was the ground cracking under him, this isn't a game. You're right, it's not, Naruto responded, it's a challenge, if you can snatch this bell from me I'll assume you're fast and strong enough to train without one. I won't be forced to do anything by the likes of you. Piccolo howled, blasting off from where he stood and delivering an earth-cracking right hand to Naruto's cheek but his attack was merely met with a chuckle and a menacing glare. Oh Piccolo. Naruto hummed melodically, slapping his hand away with enough force to send him spinning in place for a second or two before Naruto delivered his next attack, a simple flick of his finger, causing Piccolo to fly 20 feet back before skidding to a halt. You can't even deal with my aura let alone my full potential. Now then, I'll make this simple, you came to me today and wished to join us, you did this to yourself, so be prepared. For the next whole year, you will be following my orders to the letter, I will tell you when to eat, sleep and shit, if you follow my instructions we won't have any problems, but, if you step out of line I have no problem in painting these planes with your blood, am I understood? E even if I cons to your ff foolish game, why on earth am I the one forced to do this and not your puppet? Because from what I saw between you, Goki and Jine I can tell you're the weakest, the gravity seal will give you far more resistance and get you prepared much faster than a year of basic training would, Naruto answered, pulling the bell from his pocket once more, let's try this again, are you ready? F fine, Piccolo uttered bitterly, Naruto could hear the malice in his voice and he knew that if their levels were a bit more even the supposed demon king would rip him to shreds. I suppose it's a bit better than someone with a more level head stood at the helm of this new training paradigm. With a nod, Naruto tied the bell to his belt loop and prepared for what came next but not before turning to Jine to say, Jine, go find my clone, he will deal with your training, before he took to the skies before Piccolo quickly followed. As Jine made her way to her master's doppelganger she couldn't help but notice what this clone was doing. It seemed almost, magical, there he knelt, one arm still cradling the semi-conscious Gohan while his other hand was placed firmly against the terrain and as a light blue glow pulsated underneath his palm, the ground gave way to roots and wood that slowly grew into a structure. With what seemed to be such little effort Naruto was able to weave a modest compound from such a simple action, it was mesmerizing to say the least, now sure, Jain has seen quite a lot of technology that can do the same thing, build structures in a fraction of the time without any effort but the way her master did this, bending nature to his whim in order to build their barracks was something that felt like a once-in-a-lifetime sight to behold. Jine was the first to speak, you seemed rather curt with Piccolo back there, why is that? Why Jine, I didn't know you cared for your green pal, he reacted coyly. For the love of God, no. I wouldn't care if he boiled alive in his own intestinal goo. I am just curious, said Jine. I've done it for a few reasons actually, he hummed as he continued to nurse the building to its final form with a simple tiger seal, 
Based on his aura and from a few things I was told back at Came House I am aware that Piccolo has a very decorative past, much of it being evil in nature, so, the best way to make him an asset to this planet and breed out such an evil nature is by force. This raised a question, are you going to do that to me? Jine asked, trying her best not to sound too worried. No, I don't need to, said Naruto simply, you signed the contract, your actions are mine to control if you step out of line while he hasn't so I need more forceful manners. Understood. Jine nodded, seemingly okay with the answer given but couldn't help but wonder what the other reason might be. What's the other reason? As he finally finished the cabin he turned to fully address his companion hum. Oh, yes. I wasn't quite fond of how he was talking about you, so a little punishment wouldn't hurt, now would it? This was a surprise to her. Ah really? You care about what he said about me? Naruto couldn't help but chuckle at such a response, of course. You may have signed the contract but that doesn't make you devoid of emotion. You're not something I can use as a tool, you're my companion. The contract is a fail-safe of sorts, once you've proven to me that you no longer wish to commit mass genocide then I will remove it. Oh oh. I, I didn't know that, Jine answered, surprised by such a statement. He seemed to be quite a mystery to her, of course he wasn't a good man. Most good people wouldn't bind others with seals that if they speak out of turn they are burned for it but he's also not as bad the others Jine has worked for in the past, especially her previous employer, he even cared for her emotions and even considered her a companion, even Vega didn't see her as such, more of a subordinate to be barked at, so maybe, being with him won't be too bad, master, I have seen the errors of my way, my past actions are heinous and I wish to. The seal also can tell me when you're lying, Naruto said with a chuckle, but nice try though. You can't blame me for trying, she sighed before taking a closer look at their new household, so, what will our new home come with? We have four bedrooms, one for each, a rather large living quarters with a fireplace in the middle, a kitchen and, my personal favorite, a hot spring, he listed as he pointed his final finger towards the secondary attachment to the house, an open top hot spring. A hot, springs? What on earth is that? She asked you must be joking? He squealed, pretty much mortified that someone he's in close proximity to would dare not know what a hot spring is, you've never heard of a hot spring. How on earth have you been keeping yourself clean? Jine had to think on this, well, we have medical chambers along with basic bathtubs but I've never heard of a hot spring, what's so special about it? After your training today I demand you to come into the hot springs with me, said Naruto unaware of the blush growing on Jine's face at the mere idea. WW what? Bath with you. You're a man. She remarked as if such a simple statement would be enough for him to drop this conversation. And? He fired back with a rather nonchalant tone. Come on, I've lived countless decades, do you think I haven't seen the female form? I am not embarrassed by intersex bathing and if you're going to be around me you should get used to it. I promised my mother I would never see a naked man unless he was my husband and that's final. Jine hissed, hoping that would be the end of it. She hated having to use her mother in a lie but, knowing Naruto, he wouldn't have let it die until he had his way. Fine fine, you can go first but you best not soak up all the hot water. He sighed before Jine and Naruto started to head off towards an open field for her special training. Now then, I think it's time we get to work. He muttered before forming three more clones from thin air before barking orders to them like a drill sergeant. You two, go out and find us some food, make it a balanced meal. I don't want you two boneheads only getting meat, understood? With a nod the two fly off towards the horizon to hunt down some grub, and you'll be tasked with training Jine for the rest of the day. You have until 8 p.m. Sharp. Dinner should be ready by then. The clone merely nodded before responding with a robotic, Hi, it will be done. H how the hell do you keep doing that? Jine asked, staring awestruck at such a feat. Hum. He asked before what she had asked him finally clicked, making clones. I guess you can say it's one of my many skills. How many can you make? She wondered, now that is a good question. I stopped counting after 20,000. To say Jine's face was priceless would be an understatement. She looked like she had seen a ghost, what? That's insanity. Do you know how many people would kill to make an exact clone army of themselves? Trust me. I am aware. This ninjutsu of mine has pulled my ass out of the fire more times than I can count. I owe a lot to it, he said, but anyhow, you see this bell? H hi. Well, I want you to come and try to take it from me, he smirked. Jine seemed to be confused by this but master, didn't you say I was stronger than Piccolo? 
why must I do the same test? Just because the goal is the same doesn't mean the obstacles will, he remarked, you see, with the gravity seal on him I am merely going to be avoiding him so he can build up his strength and speed but for you, well, he chuckled before placing one hand behind his back and with his other extended his pointer finger, you will have to deal with a bit of offense. H how much offense? Just one finger, it'll be fine, he muttered before tying the bells around a loop on his pants. You have two hours to get this from me, let's beggy. But before he could finish his statement Jine fired off a massive key blast that was easily blocked by her master's finger. You didn't let me finish, he tried to say only to see Jine using her first attack as a distraction. Hoping her master would be too focused on blocking the key blast to see her charging him from the side. With a smile Naruto simply jumped over Jine's mad dive for the bell before releasing the key blast. Sending it directly into her with a heavy explosion. Landing a few feet away from the dust cloud he couldn't help but snicker at her attempts, not out of some form of condensation but out of joy, he was happy to see how willing she was to throw herself into this training, I think this year is going to be quite interesting, to say the least, he commented as the dust settled, revealing his slightly singed student preparing for round two. With Piccolo alright, I think this is fair enough. Hey, it'll be the one who says if it's far enough. Naruto fired back before taking a few glances around before giving a knowing nod. Yes, I believe this place is, in fact, far enough. What on earth is wrong with this man? Piccolo wondered but he kept his thoughts to himself and merely sighed and descended to the ground alongside his new training partner. Let's get this over with. Oh come now, Piccolo. Don't be such a downer, Naruto remarked as he slipped the bell from his pocket and tied it to his belt loop. If you set your mind to it this year might be entertaining. Piccolo seemed to find the statement disagreeable, firing back with, I don't need entertainment, I need results and to be honest I don't know how much a result I'll get from trying to steal a dinky little bell. Ye of little faith, but if the results are what you want then results you shall have. Naruto hummed before making a single tiger seal before the mark on Piccolo's shoulder began to glow a dull red hue, indicating the fun was about to begin. Just like before Piccolo can feel his entire body grow heavy but this time he was able to keep on his feet but barely if his popping veins and strained grunts were any indications. I is that the be best you've gg got. Piccolo muttered, slowly shifting himself into a more dignified stance in preparation for what was to come. Not even close, but I'd hate to overwhelm you. You might quit on me, was his response, causing Piccolo's gaze to steal against him, his shivering lips curving into a smug smile. H ha, you tt think so little of me? Piccolo countered. Of course not, it's just, you haven't stopped shaking since I activated it so, how about we stick with just 3gs for now? Piccolo's eyes seemed to bulge ever so slightly at Naruto's proclamation. 3 to 3gs? That's it. Hi, my lowest stage of that particular seal, he hummed before doing a few practice hops to warm up his legs for what was to come, but I must give credit where credit is due, you're still standing. Now let's see if you can give chase. See chase. Piccolo hissed, preparing to lift his leg to move only to find even the simplest of shifting difficult. T this is humiliating. My legs can barely move let alone run. It's alright, ill wait, he remarked, making his way towards a moss-covered rock before coping a squat on the softened boulder with a simple smile, his head now being propped up by his right hand in abject defiance of Piccolo's struggle. The green demon lord growled at this abundant slap to his ego. How little faith does this man have for Piccolo's strength? He's fought with every fiber of his being to be where he is today and obtain the power he has now and yet all this blonde bastard could do was sit there, smugly watching him shake under the pressure of three times Earth's gravity? D don't you dd dare. Piccolo snarled as he dug down deep and lifted his right leg as high as he could go before slamming it down with authority before copying the action for his left, underestimate me. However, all Piccolo was greeted with after his mighty decree was a half-hearted clap and Naruto's trademark smugness, you're right, taking two steps is a monumental feat, take pride in that accomplishment, Mr. Piccolo. W when I get my hands on you, Il Piccolo began, taking two more heavy steps in the direction of his target only to lose his footing, sending him smashing into the dirt with a heavy thud which only exacerbated his embarrassment. You know, maybe in about a year, you'll be able to get up to running speed, then you can hide behind a rock and let the others fight for you. I am gonna kill him. Somehow, someway. This thought continued to intensify as he continued to struggle to his feet, driving him to continue with his sheer hatred alone. 
Maybe that was Naruto's plan. Pissing off this green behemoth so he can feel himself to continue, or maybe he just found some form of joy in pushing the buttons of someone who takes themselves far too seriously. Either or, this year was going to be chock full of entertainment like he mentioned before, but to who it will be entertaining to might be up for interpretation. With Gohan black orbs fluttered open, revealing themselves to a somber view of a setting sun across a sky filled with beautiful blues and rich oranges. Something the young lady has rarely seen thanks to her usual sleep schedule that usually found her going to sleep at around 6 p.m. The sight of the setting sun seemed to wash her with a feeling of contentment. Regardless of the previous day's hardships she found herself refreshed and even happy, she couldn't wait for what the future held for her and her mother. Gohan went to stand but found her surroundings to be more malleable than the simple ground, shifting her eyes from the beauty of her surroundings to the thing, or rather, man that she was snuggled into, the face she remembered vividly, it was the man that saved her and her mother from utter disaster and even healed them with his magical hands, however, just because she knew who he was, didn't mean that she was overly excited to be this close to him. Good morning little one, he hummed as he felt Gohan's frame shifted in his arms, as he said that he saw Gohan's features shift from a neutral wonderment to concern, so much has changed since you went to sleep. W where's my mama? The girl whimpered, whipping left and right in hopes of spotting her mother's trademark GI but there was nothing other than a barren plain and a wooden building that sat behind them. Fear began to fill Gohan's heart. Where was she? She'd never seen such a place before today. Where was her mother? Why was this man holding her? Every question she could think of ran through her little mind like a bullet train, something that Naruto picked up on and tried his best to quell. It's alright, it's okay, calm down, your mother is in a safe place, he said softly, trying yet failing to bring her emotions to check. But why isn't she here? said Gohan, wiggling out of Naruto's half-hearted grip before stumbling her way towards the setting sun. Mama! She yelled, getting nothing other than a gust of sand-filled wind, Mama! As she tried her best to run in any direction that might give her a glimpse of where her mom might be she was halted by a pair of strong yet comforting arms wrapping her up and bringing her close. I know, I know, it's scary to be away from someone that love, but I am not here to hurt you, Naruto hummed softly, running his hand through her soft, mane like her to soothe her and bring her into a much easier state of being. W why is my mama not here? D did I do something wrong? Gohan asked, her face smashed against Naruto's chest as she tried her best to use his shirt as a cloth to clear her eyes of her tears but no matter how much she tried more seemed to fall. D did she leave me as Papa did? Naruto couldn't let such thoughts bubble around in her young mind, he needed to squash them before the took hold. What? No, 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 he said, pulling her to a sitting position so he could look this young lady directly in the eyes. Now. I don't know much about your father or what happened to him but your mother has not abandoned you, she left with a heavy heart, sacrificing a whole year with her child in order to protect the world. W what do you mean? She mumbled, using the sleeves of her GI to dry her cheeks. We were told by your aunt that two very strong people will be arriving here by year's end and we're all preparing for their arrival, especially your mother, he remarked, as we speak I bet she is pushing herself to the limits to grow stronger and come back as this world's champion prepared to send those who threaten this world running scared. He decreed, puffing out his chest in a show child like boastfulness, something that Gohan couldn't help but giggle at. Why you think so? She questioned I know so, he replied, tapping his heart in here, I can feel it. It has been about five months or so since the defenders of Earth began their training. Krillin along with her band of Z fighters have taken Mr. Popo's offer for training and have found themselves gripped in unending battles that tested them against apparitions of fallen Saiyan warriors in hopes of getting them prepared for what is to come. Goki has finally finished her long trek across the legendary Snakeway and found herself on a small planet that had five times the Earth's natural gravity. There she met King Kai, a well-respected elder god that, surprisingly, was nothing like Goki thought he would be, with such a lofty title of King Kai she assumed he would be preem proper and completely full of himself but, come to find out, he was nothing more than a goofball. Even his first test was to tell him a joke of all things. The second was to catch his pet monkey Bobo, a feat that, on earth, would be child's play for Goki but, not so much on this planet, she could barely walk let alone capture a speeding monkey, she had to resort to abandoning her weighted clothing if she was to even have a chance of catching him. This went on for almost a solid month but, thankfully, she caught him just in time to partake in King Kai's third trail, bashing his cricket Gregory with a hammer. 
While Goki continued her unorthodox training in the afterlife there was one final group of defenders pushing themselves to their very limits in order to be enough to protect the world they call home. The ground of the barren plains shifted and rocked in unholy synchronization as two forces collide against one another. Testing their might to see who would yield this particular clash before resetting and starting anew, the landscape of these plains was dotted with sparks caused by these collisions that lasted but a moment before vanishing and appearing once more in the distance. Most who would look upon this scene would think it was some strange climate phenomenon but to one in particular, who sat atop a stone pillar, could see what truly caused this strange battle. Come now, is that all you have for me? A cocky snicker could be heard throughout the plains as Jine appeared on top of another stone pillar that jutted from the soil beneath them. Landing on the adjacent pillar was her sparring partner Piccolo, who had shed his weighted clothing and was preparing for his second attack. Trust me, you've seen nothing yet. Piccolo smirked as he looked to be preparing for what was to come. Before Jine could respond she heard the ground underneath her feet give way to two green hands, the same hands of her sparring partner before they latched onto her ankles and yanked her down through the flooring. Destroying the pillar she stood on in one swift motion. As she came to the end of the pillar she was greeted with a doppelganger of Piccolo, no doubt one of his strange alien techniques, but she had little time to ponder on what this technique was as she prepared to fire off a key blast to dislodge Piccolo's clone from her ankle, she reached out her hand to launch her attack but Jine wasn't fast enough to deal with Piccolo's retaliation, his antenna glowed a sickly blue before an electrical current shot out of them, shocking Jine into paralysis. DD damn it, Jine replied through gritted teeth as she found her body unresponsive to what was to come. As she tried her best to break free Piccolo's clone used its hold against her and began spinning her around like a sack of potatoes. Building up speed before releasing her from his grasp. Sending her skidding across the ground like a rock atop a river. Her paralysis wore off at the end of her throw, allowing her to dig her heels into the dirt to halt her movement. Her stoppage came just in time as she was quickly greeted by her dual green combatants. Each with a cocked fist in the intent to harm with a hefty roar. Jine's aura exploded from her before she blocked both attacks without hesitation, her grip tightened as the sound of bones popping could be heard throughout the plains, I've gotta say, that was a clever move, however, Jine said before her power began to rise once more, this time the earth around her reacting to it with a thunderous shake, mere tricks won't be enough for Vega, Nappa or me. And with that, her aura exploded once more, sending Piccolo and his clone flying backwards as she prepared for her next attack extending both of her hands in the direction of the two her hands glowed a purple hue before forming two orbs that hovered over her palms, double Sunday. She proclaimed as the two orbs shot out into beams of purple light aimed directly at the two piccolos. The real piccolo seemed to be able to recover from his throw faster than his counterpart, allowing him to amount some form of offense while his clone was vaporized by Jine's attack, with little time to respond. Piccolo pumped every ounce of strength and key into his left hand and, with a mighty shout, slapped the purple beam with vicious intent, redirecting the beam directly into the secondary beam, causing an explosion that singed Piccolo severally. Once again the duo clashed in a battle of speed and power. All the while their teacher sat up high on an undamaged pillar as he watched their battle with a simple smile, pleased with what he was seeing. For the past five months, he has watched both Piccolo and Jine grow from embittered enemies to a growing rivalry as each wish to gain an upper hand against one another in their training. During the five-month time period, Piccolo and Jine have grown quite exponentially, each skyrocketing past their previous barriers and finding new heights they never knew they could. Though he was proud of how they seemed to change physically it was the personal changes that he truly cared for Piccolo. The stoic demon king who wishes to surpass Goki and rule the world has found himself with a more peaceful aura. Now, it would be foolish to say that Piccolo's original malice was wiped away but Naruto can tell within his aura that he's softening day by day, soon. He might even be a main ally, while Naruto was happy with his progress with Piccolo he was more interested in the subtle changes happening within Jine, first starting with her discarding of her Saiyan armor. After two months of harsh training under the immortal Uzumaki Jine's armor was in utter shambles. Cracks could be seen on pretty much every section of it, and yet even though Naruto said he'd be more than willing to fix it but Jine seemed unwilling to do so, seemingly happy that her attire was falling to pieces, the next day she came out of her room wearing the underclothing she usually wears under her armor, a sleeveless black tank top that seemed to hug her in just the right way and a pair of matching shorts. 
If Naruto had to put his finger on why she allowed her armor to fall into ruin it was probably a symbol to her. A symbol of her attachment to the world outside of this little planet. A symbol of this supposed tyrant Jain speaks about only in her dreams, or maybe she just didn't like her armor, who truly knows. All that truly mattered was that Jain has seemed to really grow during the past five months both physically and emotionally. Maybe after the Saiyan invasion ill, Naruto's mind pondered only to feel a presence drawing near his location as a playful smirk appeared on his lips. Behind him crept a small little girl, using the uneven terrain and shrubbery that sat up top this pillar as her makeshift cover as she slowly made her way towards her target, Gotcha! yelled Gohan, jumping from the closet's bush and preparing to tackle her supposedly unsuspecting guardian only to see that within an instant he vanished, leaving her momentum aimed directly off the cliff's edge. Joy turned to terror as the edge grew closer and closer as Gohan tried everything in her power to stop her momentum but found herself incapable of doing so. Her only course of action left was to close her eyes and wait for the end to come. However, before she fell to her doom she felt a slight tug on her purple GI, stopping her moment in an instant. Turning to the source she found Naruto standing next to her with a cheeky grin. I hate to break this to you, but you're about 3000 years too young to sneak up on me. It'll get you someday. I just know it, Gohan declared definitely. Something that pleased Naruto to see, since the past five months he noticed a nice change within Gohan that was similar to Jain. With the interaction with new faces and new situations Gohan has come out of her shell far more than she did when they first encountered. Of course, during the first month she was still very much terrified of, well, everything but, from what Gohan said, she had spent most of her life up in the mountains with her mother not really interacting with others so her social skills were quite lacking, though, after some helpful prodding from Naruto, Gohan had begun to explore the outside planes and interact with Jain and Piccolo more and more until this four-man team began to feel like it's their own little family. If you keep trying, I am sure you will, Naruto chuckled, returning to his spot on the edge of the stone pillar which was soon mimicked by his new little tag along. Gohan looked out over the planes, Noticing the wide arrangement of sparks and clashes that exploded around them, she couldn't make out exactly what was happening but she knew it had to be Mr. Piccolo and Auntie Jine battling it out like they do every afternoon. So, how's an Auntie Jine doing? They seem to be doing well, I can tell they've improved greatly from what they were months ago. Naruto commented, his eyes lazily scanning the battle unfolding before him, as he's mentioned, they've been growing quite a lot in strength, Piccolo and Jine have doubled almost tripled their natural speed, strength and stamina over the past few months, he can't really tell their power levels as they put it but he can tell their aura has definitely shifted in potency, they should be proud of their growth. After his decree he noticed Gohan go to speak only for her to stop and turn her attention back to the fight at hand, what's wrong, little one? She was slow to answer, trying her best to formulate her thoughts before speaking, e everyone is fighting so hard for what is about to happen, she began, fiddling with her fibrics, I I don't know, I just feel, like I should be doing something to help too. Naruto seemed taken aback by the little one's statement before a simple smile grasped his lips, that's a nice thought to have but not every fight is meant for you, one day you will be called upon to fight for the safety of your world but for now, allow yourself to be a child. Gohan didn't seem to like that answer, shaking her head in defiance before declaring, but don't we need everyone at their best? I think we have enough champions for this particular fight, he remarked as he recalled the names of those who would be participating in this coming battle in seven months' time. We have Jine, your mother, Mr. Piccolo, Krill, and the remaining Z fighters, whoever those might be, so I believe we, be he wasn't allowed to continue as Gohan, uncharacteristically so, spoke up with her own statement. What if it's not enough? She asked, bringing up such a point that maybe Naruto had missed or looked over in his arrogance. Jain tells me these guys that are coming are massively strong, she's worried that even your training won't be enough to prepare for what is to come, A and B besides, Mr. Piccolo told me that I have a gift that I should NT let go to waste. Oh, he did now. Naruto hummed, making a mental note to have a chat with Mr. Piccolo over what he has said. Yeah, he said that I was able to wound Andy Jain because of my anger, said the black-haired halfling, her eyes glowing with a sense of Saiyan pride something that was nice to see. Though happy to see her smile, Naruto replied with, do you remember that? She nodded, though you could tell in her eyes that it was hard for her to get a clear description of events, be bits and pieces, I remember seeing my mama in danger and, and then I saw red, 
I felt rage building in me wishing to be let out, then I was outside, about a foot away from my mother and my head was really sore. A power you can't control isn't a power we need on the battlefield, Gohan, sighed the Uzumaki as he felt a pinging sense of irony from such a statement. Here he is lecturing another of the danger of using their wild and crazy power when, during his youth, he did the exact same thing. I suppose the do as I say, not as I do mentality really does apply sometimes. Mr. Piccolo sure thought so. Well, Mr. Piccolo is wrong. Naruto said with a bit of curtness in his voice. Now he really needed to talk with Piccolo. Besides, I was tasked by your mother in making sure you were protected. I believe bringing you into that battlefield seven months down the road would break that promise. At the mention of her mother Gohan's face brightened, almost as if she had the perfect counter for this. Ka-chan would be excited to know I want to learn to fight. I can't risk breaking a promise, fired back Naruto she bit her lip in frustration, come on, it's just one promise. I haven't broken a single promise as long as I've walked this expansive dimension and I refuse to break one now, with such a statement Gohan knew that his view wasn't going to be so easily changed on the matter. Why are you so adamant about training so much, Gohan? Because, shouted the half-blood but her outburst shriveled as she found some semblance of her composer, B because, I was a burden to my mama when Jine came to earth. It almost cost us a lot if you hadn't shown up, I I don't want to be a burden anymore. I didn't know you felt that way, Naruto said, he hadn't realized how much the events between Jine and her mother must have changed her perspective, let me think about it, alright, I'll give you my answer by tomorrow. Her features seemed to perk, you promise. I give you my word, he smiled, as he patted her head, now then, who's hungry? Me, 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 she squealed, jumping from her spot, alright then, go on inside and get washed up, I'll get the others, and with that, the two dispersed. Gohan rushed off towards the edge to climb herself down, something she's grown rather fond of doing over the past few months, while Naruto simply vanished from sight with a gust of smoke and wind. His disappearing act corresponded with the two warring factions on the ground still battling it out finally coming into view, both appearing on either side of their battleground. Sweat, grime and swelling was starting to build on the two combatants but none of it seemed to wipe the smile from their faces. They looked like children playing their favorite game as they began to build up for their final confrontation. Auras sparked and dust flew as their bodies, almost magnetically drawn towards another, sprung forth in hopes of finding out who would come out the victor. That's enough for today, you too, Naruto smiled, appearing between their raging climax, halting both of their coming strikes with a deflection of his outstretched hands, the two rushing balls of aura and force spun out, each skidding to the right or left of Naruto's current position. Damn you, Naruto, barked Piccolo, trying his best to find his bearings after such a forceful stop, is this how you get your own sick, twisted enjoyment? Tormenting us when we least expect it? I believe you just answered your own question, Jine responded as she did the same, though her attitude towards Naruto's sudden arrival didn't seem as set upon as her green companion's was, maybe it was the five months with him but she's grown accustomed to such a sporadic and quirky entrance. All he could do was chuckle and replied with, I hear your complaints and I will make sure to file them away for future review. Jine couldn't help but stifle a snicker when she noticed the throbbing veins that began to pop into view on Piccolo's bald head. No matter how long they've been around each other it seems like Naruto can find a way to get under the green demon's skin. But anyhow, I think that's enough fun for one day, boys and girls. It is time for us to stuff our faces with my finest dish to date. While the famished Saiyans seemed to find the prospect of food to be exciting a sour sneer seemed to crawl across Piccolo's tired features before he remarked, HMPH, let me guess, that cretinous food you tried forcing down my gull. Hi, hi, you've made your point well known Mr. Piccolo, you don't eat our human food, Naruto interrupted with a snide chuckle as he placed a delicate hand on his exhausted trainee's shoulder, so don't worry, I've made you something special tonight. S special. Start here asterisk hold still. A strained yet quite audible demand could be heard through the compound even towards the spa where the two Saiyan ladies found themselves relaxing after devouring Naruto's cooking with the speed and veracity that only a Saiyan could, with a middling sigh. Jine continued to let herself get lost in her bath while Naruto continued forward with his psychological torture of the son of the demon king. The sound of shattered porcelain and fumbling furniture filled the late afternoon air as she knew Piccolo was fighting off the incoming dish that Naruto had prepared for him. What it was Jine couldn't even fathom a guess too, he refused to tell, no, stay away from me you monster. 
He cried before the distinct poof sound could be heard from the dining room, changing their one-on-one -on -one battle into a handicapped affair. In a matter of moments, the clone had its arm wrenched around Piccolo's throat while his remaining one grabbed hold of his upper jaw and pulled it wide open, giving full access to his creator in the purple boiling liquid he had before him. Now that I have your full, undivided attention I hope you enjoy my latest concoction, he snickered with a heinous grin oh, and don't worry, I made sure it's 95% water. As the sound of gargling and yelps continued Jine couldn't help but roll her eyes and sink deeper into the pool, allowing everything from the neck down to soak in the soothing properties of their spa, humph, they act like children. I don't know, I like it, Gohan snickered, kicking her little legs in a melodic rhythm seeing as she couldn't fully reach the bottom just yet, it reminds me of my mom, she's so strong but she always found time to be herself. For someone as strong as he is he surely doesn't act like it, from all of her experience people of such ungodly strength have been nothing more than, dictators and brutes who find joy in the pain of others, so to see such a joyful and playful creature like him who toyed with her so easily is both charming but confusing at the same time, we don't have the luxury of humor right now, every second we waste playing with one another as another second Vega and Nappa grow closer to us. As Jain speaks of Saiyans to come, Gohan couldn't help but voice a question she's wished to ask for a while, are they really that powerful, Jain san Raising a digit from below the surface, Jain proclaimed, a single one of them can wipe out a planet with zero resistance or hesitation, knowing that both will be coming should strike fear in the hearts of every man, woman, and child. W wow. That's, that's a lot to take in, and her statement wasn't wrong. The young Saiyan's stomach felt heavy after such a description, but they were your teammates, right? Couldn't they maybe see reason if you spoke to them? Ha ha ha. Reason? Your naivete is adorable, she snickered smugly. Saiyans don't understand reason or diplomacy. They only understand how to conquer and that's exactly what they're planning to do, and I don't know if I can stop them. Don't think you're alone in this, Jain, Gohan decreed, we won't let you carry this by yourself. Jain appreciated the sentiment but reality has proven again and again to her that numbers don't always add up to a victory, you don't know what they're willing to do to win, little one. Then tell us, maybe you can give us something that can give us an edge over the, Gohan began trying her best to use Jain's knowledge of their coming foes to maybe make a plan or something that could help them in the long run. There is no edge over then, Gohan. Just stop it, but Jain silenced her. I know what you're trying to do and it's kind of you, but they are elite Saiyan warriors, top of their class, cold-blooded killers who won't stop until they get what they want and once they do, there's no need for us anymore. A silence hung over the two for a moment, Naruto can stop them. Just because he could slap me around doesn't mean he can hold a candle against Vega or Nappa. Jain hated to admit it but it was something that was drilled into her since birth. Being able to do something to her means nothing to the tears above. I am nothing more than low-class scum. They wouldn't fear what he's done. If anything they'd be more disgusted that he didn't end me like he should have. The more they talked the harder it was for Gohan to hold back her growing fear. T these people, they seem terrible. You don't know the half of it. The look that appeared on Jain's face wasn't one that could be misconstrued. She did not look back on these Saiyans with fondness. I've known them all my life and I've never once seen an ounce of sympathy or remorse from either of them even after we heard about our world's fate. Though through most of their time together Jain has held an aura of aloofness at this moment Gohan could see an ounce of that facade crack. The destruction of planet Vegeta hit me hard. Even though we were raised to grow numb to the idea of loss I couldn't help but feel a sense of emptiness when I knew my mother was gone. Gohan noticed the shifting in tone and wished to continue. This was the first time she has ever opened up to her since she's been here and shed hate for it to stop now. What about your father? What about him? Gohan could tell she hit a nerve. WW were you not, as sad about his passing? She mumbled, trying her best not to push too hard, shed hate for her to shut down. I barely knew my father, Jain grumbled looking to the setting sun instead of her niece's wanting eyes, the men of the Saiyan race were blunt and unfeeling, only worried about the continuation of their namesake and to hopefully breed a powerful offspring that could make a strong warrior for the race, he was disappointed when he found out I was born with a measly power level of 25, not only that but I was a girl. H he told you that. Gohan gasped, she shook her head no, her pitch now more heated than before, he didn't have to. I could tell in his eyes every time he saw me in the chatter from those who worked alongside him, I wasn't his child, I was a mistake and Kakarot was his do-over, the only thing I am sad about is not being able to see the look on his face when he saw that he had a second daughter. 
I am sorry, was all Gohan could think to say after what she heard. Maybe it wasn't what was needed but Gohan felt like she had to say it, no one should have to deal with that. Jain scoffed at her apology, it doesn't matter anymore. The old bastard is dead and gone, who cares? A dark chuckle left her lips but it seemed to drag the mood down a bit more than she was expecting so she decided it was best to change the subject. What about you? This time it would seem that Gohan's mood started to shift, a bit nervous at the question now asked of her. What do you mean? Jain just shrugged and continued. I didn't see any sign of Kakarot's maid around here and I would suspect he'd be looking for his child sooner or later, so, where's your father? I wouldn't know, Gohan murmured, he left when I was a few months old. Oh oh. I suppose it was Jain's turn to feel speechless. My mother doesn't talk about it all that much, she cried about it a lot when I was around one or two but she seems to have found a way to look past it, Gohan spoke voidlessly, almost as if reading off a menu or something similar. Why did he leave? My mo as Gohan seemed to find the right words to speak a shockingly bright green light began to expel from the rice paper walls of the compound that resided behind them, explosive demon wave. A blinding yellow beam shot from the house and narrowly avoiding the springs the two ladies resided in before clashing with an earth pillar that stood about a yard or two away from the compound. As rubble subsided the two Saiyan ladies peered past the lip of the hot spring tub to get a better look at what on earth was happening, as of this moment, they could see Naruto, now furious, manhandling a scampering Piccolo who is trying his best to escape his reach with little effect, you dare put a hole in my compound. After I've fed you, is this what you consider manners from your misbegotten kind? Naruto stormed as he snagged Piccolo by his foot and flung him through the hole he made, skipping him across the hardened terrain like a rock over water. Fucking morons, Gina muttered under her breath as Gohan could only giggle at it all. Ah, this is what I needed. Naruto moaned as he let his body ease into the soothing warmth of the hot spring water. His tensed muscles now stretching out and allowing him to relax his body fully, as he continued to rest his aged form he peered over his shoulder to make sure his ungrateful houseguest was still doing the job assigned to him, i.e., cleaning up the mess he made, when I am done soaking in an hour that place better be spotless or we're going to see just how far those limbs of yours can stretch. Hello? Hum? Naruto hummed, scanning his area with a hesitant glance, hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Quickly he began to realize where this voice could be coming from and only one being could do such a thing, Karama? He smiled, hoping to hear his friend's voice once again, Karama is that you? Is he going crazy out there? Piccolo wondered, peering out of the him-shaped hole as he watched Naruto shuffle around in hip-deep water talking to himself. He thought against pressing forward with his inquiry seeing as whatever the hell he was going through he surely doesn't need his help with it. Kura who? No, it's me, Goki. Can you hear me, Naruto? Though disappointed that it wasn't a blast from his past Naruto's smile never wavered. Oh Goki. Yes, of course, I can. How did you get into my head? Well, that's not exactly what's going on. King Kai is letting me use his powers of telepathy to speak with you. I needed to see how everyone is shaping up and I wanted to know how Gohan was doing. Of course, he obliged, returning to his rested position in his spa. Well, to make a long story short, I think Piccolo and Jain have grown leaps and bounds compared to what they were when they arrived, with the next seven months I think they'll be at a level they never thought possible in such a short amount of time. Do you think it'll be enough to win though? That I can't be certain. I have yet to meet the challengers and I don't want to bloat anyone's head further by saying that they'll be ready by the end of it. All I can say is I'll train them the best I can. Much is still up in the air about these Saiyans. He knows very little about them or how they'll react. Had loved to say that Jain and Piccolo could run through them but he simply can't. I understand. What about Gohan? How is she doing? She's doing great. I would go get her but right now she's asleep. She seemed to have taken to the outdoors quite instinctively. She's made friends with a few of the prehistoric creatures running around in her fear, though still there, isn't as prominent as it was before, he chuckled, recounting the many times he's been taken out of his meditation by Gohan bringing home another scaly friend in hopes of keeping him, her, though, there is something I'd like to bring up with you. Yes? With a scratch of his cheek, Naruto said, as she wants me to train her alongside Piccolo and Jine. What? She's never shown any interest in fighting whatsoever beforehand. I gathered as much, said the Dimension Hopper. Gohan's previous attitude didn't lend itself to wanting to learn to fight. She believes it would be best if she learned how to fight in order to help in the coming battle, having all hands on deck as it were. 
I told her we had enough warriors for this particular bout but she wasn't having any of it, she wanted to train and she refused to listen to reason. Well, I suppose she has gotten something from me after all. Naruto cocked a brow to that. What? No, nothing, it's nothing. The idea of Gohan fighting the coming Saiyans makes me sick to my stomach, B but, her training wouldn't be such a bad idea. Are you giving me permission? I won't lift a finger unless I hear you give me your blessing, he remarked sternly. Naruto, I want you to train my daughter, but under no circumstances will she be allowed to fight those Saiyans, am I understood? With a bow, Naruto spoke, Hi, I'll give you my word. Thank you. Naruto, you're doing a lot for both my family and my planet, don't think it goes unseen. In my shoes, I believe you'd do the same, he smiled. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think it's time to go, King Kai's back is getting all sweaty. Goki muttered and before their connection ended Naruto could hear a barrage of threats and screams coming from the supposed King Kai, leaving him with a smile, he sinks back into his position in the springs, once more in hopes of allowing his body to rest and take in the beautiful scenery, the calm plains of this barren tundra, the spires of rocks that jut from the earth like flowers, and the full moon that rest perfectly in the sky like a. As his mind began to drift the sound of splintering wood caught his attention as the compound that laid mere feet behind bowed out. Revealing the blackened form of a massive ape with piercing red eyes and large gaping maw, the beast continued to grow in size as its gaze was set upon the moon, his limbs swinging haphazardly around smashing anything that stood in its wake before letting out an earthquaking roar from the depths of its soul. After the beast's declaration was done it shambled out from the rubble of the compound and jumped its way toward the tallest stone pillar almost as if to get closer to the moon itself. All Naruto could do was blink at such a display, well, that was, unexpected. God damn it! cried Piccolo, blasting the rubble off of him with a flex of key, his teeth clenched in rage, if it's not one thing it's another. Piccolo, language, Naruto proclaimed, stepping from his soothing time in the tub before his clothing morphed around him like a mirage, almost as if his body was already clothed and his naked form was the illusion. It was a strange scene on top of many that have brought themselves forth tonight. Jine, are you alright in there? W what just happened? Jine muttered through a yawn shoving a portion of the roof off of her as if it was the top of her comforter, knocking the sawdust and wood chips out of her messy bed hair as she tried her best to focus on the scene placed before her. To be honest, I am not entirely sure myself, Naruto merely shrugged, pointing his sage-like staff towards the beast now posted on top of its pillar, howling its lungs off, Jine's tired eyes soon swelled to the size of dinner plates, bursting from her demolished room and landing next to the ledge their home away from home once stood, getting a good look at this newly awakened beast. Oh god. Jine muttered as her two tag-alongs made their way towards her side. You two idiots are lucky to have me or this could have gotten out of hand. I'll admit I've never dealt with this particular monkey but I've tussled with a few large animals in my day, tend to be specific, Naruto claimed matter-of-factly, almost as if it was a point of pride to pin on his lapel like a badge. Well, this particular monkey isn't one you'd want to fight seeing as it's Gohan, Jine said jabbing a thumb towards their point of contention. What? Piccolo's bewilderment echoed throughout the plains, catching the attention of one mighty ape, turning her head, the ape opened her maw and unleashed a blinding white beam of light aimed directly towards the three onlookers. Piccolo and Jine quickly take flight in order to dodge the incoming blast while Naruto formed a cervical shield before him as he tanked the blast with minimum struggle, a smile sneaking upon his features, while he's blocking the blast he creates a clone who takes flight towards Jine and Piccolo's location while his original form keeps the monkey's attention. How is that, thing Gohan? Piccolo hissed, pointing a disappointing green digit towards the vicious, uncontrolled beast swinging at the buzzing form of Naruto with reckless abandon, it's a rampaging monster. You seem kinda impressed, Piccolo, Naruto hummed, Piccolo seemed to ponder for a moment. I'd be lying if I said the power this creature has wouldn't be useful in battle, especially again. I am going to stop you right there, Jine remarked, raising a hand to halt Piccolo's mad ramblings, there's no way that Gohan will be able to use such a form against the Saiyans. W why not? Well, for starters, our entire people can transform like this, so if she transforms on the battlefield so will Vega and Nappa, next, it takes years for a Saiyan to be able to control their great ape form. So while she's swinging at everything that's breathing, Vega and Nappa will be picking her apart, and finally, I don't believe they would let us wait until the dead of night for her to transform in the first place. So, 
This is something all of your race can do, huh? Amazing. Naruto hummed, staring at the struggle below with childlike wonder. Astounded by the power produced by such a quick transformation, it reminded him of a Jinchuriki's ability but instead of being selectively given to nine people it is given to a whole race. How is it triggered? Two things really. Jain remarked as she unraveled her tail around her waist. First you need your tail, if it's not fully grown then you won't be affected by the Blutz waves. The what? Blutz waves, they're energy waves created by the planet's moon. Once a Saiyan lays eyes on the moon for the first time their heart bounds and muscles stretch until they become their strongest form, Azoru. She declared dramatically, almost like this was rehearsed. Maybe it was something taught to her at a young age along with the other boys and girls of her people. Children like Gohan have a harder time controlling the urge to transform once they see the moon while adults have been trained to control such a situation. So, what's next? Asked Piccolo, getting a cocked brow from Jain in return. We can't just let her keep rampaging through the plains until morning. There are only three ways to stop the rampaging Azoru, cut off its tail, kill it or blow up the source of its blutz waves, she numbered off on her fingers. You mean to blow up the moon? She nodded, that sounds like a horrible idea. Though Naruto wasn't wrong Jine couldn't help but snicker, I knew of a planet that did that once they found out that we were coming to invade, it didn't stop us from taking over. It just took us a week instead of our usual three-day cakewalk. Lovely, he muttered, before we try anything might I have a crack at something? If you wish, don't blame me if you get hurt, with Jain's blessing. His clone disperses, giving the real one a pause of thought for a moment as he allowed himself time to digest what his clone had just gifted him. With a knowing nod, he proceeded with his plan as he produced three truth-seeking orbs and charged forth to face the howling Azoru. With zero hesitation the beast took a swing, clashing with the now extended first orb which wrapped around the creature's hand like an unbreaking vice before hoisting above her head, before she could react to her bound appendage her left fist was snatched up by the secondary orb before sending it up right next to her previous hand, the two onlookers grew curious as they flew down just a bit closer to see what his next move was going to be. As for his final orb, it snuggly fit around her elongated mouth like a muzzle, stopping any form of retaliation for whatever Naruto had in store for her. I am sorry little one, this will be over quickly, he whispered before shutting his eyes as the outside world went silent, no crickets chirped nor wind blew, until his eyes opened once more, revealing crimson eyes with three spinning tomos that soon mirrored in the wild Azorus eyes. As his eyes reflected into hers the beast's sporadic movement quickly settled and her labored breaths stopped altogether. Leaving this Azoru in a semi-catatonic state, something Jain has never seen before, to see a beast of legend and power reduced so easily to a static figure unable to do anything but stare into his eyes was something of beauty but, also, in a strange way, terror. This was not a simple being like she keeps mistaking him for, he's something beyond their world with abilities they've never even come close to recreating. It didn't take long for this strange trance-like state the Azoru was in to slowly bring her back down to size the massive muscular frame of a great ape reduced to nothing more than a little girl all thanks to the power of this mon's strange ocular power, it was something otherworldly. Once Gohan was back down to a manageable size Naruto took her into his arms, wrapped her in his robe and made his way back towards their decimated house, leaving his captivated audience waiting for some form of explanation. What the hell was that? yelled Piccolo, screeching to a halt at Naruto's side who, at the moment, has already gotten three clones working on remodeling their home. Naruto, seemingly annoyed with the volume in which Piccolo addressed him with, pinched the green demon's lips shut with his free hand like you would a child, volume control, Mr. Piccolo, learn it or I will teach it to you myself. Jine, just like Piccolo, landed beside the blonde-haired enigma but her tone seemed far more reserved than it was in previous conversations, Naruto, T that ability, what did you? She began but after releasing Piccolo's lips Naruto began. It's not a simple answer but I'll try to explain it the best I can. As he spoke he motioned for each of his companions to look at his eyes, which shifted from his deep blues to the red three tomoed eyes that he had before. These are what is known in my world as Sharingans, they were dujutsus, or eye techniques, exclusively used by a clan known as the Uchiha. I won't go into the history of their people or how I got them right now but just know that these eyes of mine have a lot of special abilities, one of them I used was known as a genjutsu. Whatever this genjutsu thing is, it must be powerful, Jain remarked, nothing can snap an Azoru out of its charge like that. It is, 
A genjutsu is an illusionary technique that affects the senses of all living beings. It tricks the brain into believing what I want you to believe. Whatever you feel within a genjutsu isn't real but within it you're unable to discern the difference, with Gohan. I made her feel peace and the desire to sleep, he explained calmly, though his audience seemed to be growing more and more confused at the moment. Piccolo stared in dumbed silence after such a statement, and how long have you had this ability? Tapping his chin Naruto racked his brain to find the answer, after the fourth shinobi war. The wa, never mind, the point being is we've all been worrying about the coming invasion and now is the time you tell us you have the power to control minds. Piccolo shouted, seemingly more animated than usual. I didn't say duh. Naruto went to clarify but was stopped by his green student. Semantics. All they have to do is look into your eyes and they're yours, Piccolo declared emphatically. Naruto was quick to rebuke such a claim. Any physical pain outside in the real world will snap anyone out of my genjutsu. We just need one fatal blow, Jine spoke up who, for the most part, seemed in deep thought but looked to be growing more and more on board with this idea. And if it's not? His hypothetical didn't seem to stop Piccolo's continuous rant. You're acting like this is a big deal to you, Piccolo remarked. We've seen how you can handle seemingly unmatchable odds, who knows if this battle will be any different, why pretend to be a man when you're obviously beyond that? I see, was all Naruto could say, I didn't think this problem would start to crop up so quickly in this dimension but it would seem it was a mistake on my part. Piccolo didn't like the sound of that, problem? What problem? The problem being that I am some fix all for your troubles, just point me in the direction of your problem of the week and I shall solve it, so, let me lay down a rule or two right now, I decide when I step into a fight, not you. Am I understood? Naruto demanded. Why you misunderstand, N-Nar, M Master, Jain began but felt her slave mark burn ever so slightly, it's been a while since she's felt it be used but at the moment Naruto wasn't trying to be friendly, his point had to be made, we aren't looking to tell you when to fight, B but with your strength and abilities you could win this fight without bloodshed. I will not let a single soul pass the day the Saiyans land down. However, in my time I've seen what an over-reliance on my abilities can do to the people relying on it, it can cause weakness and aversion to conflict. So, understand me when I say, I will not lift a finger in the coming battle unless I believe it is needed, the look in Naruto's eyes spoke volumes, this was no joke and he wasn't going to waver from such a point, after the two nodded Naruto turned on his heel and started making his way into the already semi-finished house his clones have made, giving the remaining two a moment to speak in private. You talked us out of our biggest ally in the coming fight, you blithering idiot. Jain hissed under her breath, just loud enough for her intended target to hear but not loud enough for her retreating master to. You had the same mindset that I did, don't pretend like it was all my idea. Piccolo fired back, his rage equal to the Saiyans, now knowing that Naruto's aid is up in the air. This battle was not looking as cut and dry as he was hoping. Now all he could hope was the coming months of training for all parties involved will give them the strength to do what must be done. Minus seven months later the day had finally come, the supposed date of the Saiyan's arrival. To say that tensions were high for all involved would be an understatement at this point, as of now each individual who desired to train for the coming threat could only wait for what was to come. Keeping their senses trained for anything that could indicate the beginning of this showdown, at least, that's what they would be doing if not for one singular problem. Of all the days for him to just up and disappear head pick today of all days, Naruto Uzumaki was missing and his group wasn't happy about it, where is he? Where on earth is he? Piccolo snarled, storming back into the living room to confront Jain who, at the moment, seemed distressed at her master's absence. She shook through her dismay and responded, I don't know, why are you screaming at me? Don't try and play me like the fool, woman. I know you were the last one to see him, the greenlit decreed causing the young Saiyan's eyes to widen just a tad. Oh, do you really think your secret meetings in the dead of night are really that secret, Jine? We live in the same household and my ears hear everything. She couldn't find a response to such a claim as her features were peppered with a light blush, trying her best to keep her composure. Why you know, that's rather creepy of you to keep tabs on my movements at night. Will you quit dodging my questions and answer me? He all but yelled, we could be moments away of the Saiyan's arrival. The Z fighters are preparing to arrive and now Naruto is nowhere to be see, as the demon continued his ranting and raving the final member of their little group emerged from her room at the end of the hall. Hey, what's all the yelling about? It's too early in the morning for that, 
Gohan hummed, rubbing the sleep from her eyes as she adjusted her twisted sleepwear. Mr. Piccolo, why do you look so upset? Piccolo sighed, trying his best to keep his cool in front of the youngest of their little dysfunctional family, Naruto up and left. Hum. What makes you think that? Gohan asked, seemingly unfazed by Piccolo's statement as she made her way past them and towards the living room couch. Because Jain and I can't find a single trace of him, we've searched the house, around the plains, his favorite meditating spots, everywhere and we come up with nothing, Piccolo said before a thought popped into his head, maybe he ran scared. Jain emphatically denied it, no, 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 of course not, he wouldn't just leave M, I mean us behind like this. Oh really? And why's that? He told us that he won't raise his hand in this fight unless he deems it worthy. Maybe he decided it wasn't and ran back to his home dimension with his tail between his legs. This thought seemed to have been bouncing around in Piccolo's head since this morning and now, with every piece of evidence pointing to it he couldn't help but to agree with it. Then why did he stick around for so long? Train us. Prepare us. The Saiyan wondered. Piccolo merely shrugged before responding with, trial by fire, perhaps, beef us up and then go to high land so he can watch while we fight for our lives. That doesn't sound like Naruto, if this was his idea wouldn't he have given us a heads up? She asked which was answered by Piccolo's cocked brow. When has he ever given us a heads up of his plans or ideas? His statement couldn't be denied, Naruto was always a fly by the seat of his pants kind of man, meaning he very rarely put major thought into his ideas or give people heads up for said plan. Jain bit her lip in frustration, finding her reasoning now back into a corner and with little options to defend it, Gohan, come on aren't you going to help me here? I would but first, did you guys happen to see this? The little girl hummed, presenting a folded letter with the Uzumaki swirl embedded on its front, I found it on the coffee table. Piccolo, Jain hummed, you said you searched the whole house. Aye aye, I did, there's no way that it was, Aichi must have done something too, Piccolo stammered. We don't have time for this, Jain sighed, shoving past the rambling Namikian before, in an instant, snatched the note up, shredded it open and scanned it for every single letter her master had written for them. Her fervent energy seemed to dissipate as she slowly came to the letter's end. Her narrowed, focused eyes were now bugged and worrisome. This didn't play well with the others who were waiting for her to explain. Well, Gohan began, tugging on Jain's long hair in hopes of snapping her from her stupor. What does it say? I knew it, he abandoned us, didn't he? Piccolo huffed. And no, no. He's doing something much, much worse, she whimpered, turning to face her team with a ghastly gaze, he's bringing the Saiyans straight to us. What? Gohan and Piccolo screeched, you have to be joking, he's not that stupid. Read it yourself. Presenting to the duo in question they began to read what she had previously, the mad explanation of their most powerful ally. Good morning, I know you all must be wondering where I am on such an important day but, I assure you, my absence serves a much higher purpose. You see, at five this morning I could feel the faint presence of these two Saiyans entering our world's solar system and that made me think, what should we do about their arrival? From what Jain has told us they care little about life beyond their own so why don't I circumvent any form of collateral and bring them to us? Once they breach our Earth's atmosphere ill capture their spacecraft and bring them straight back to our designated fighting spot. I know it would have been best to discuss this before going off half-cocked but time was of the essence and besides, you all know planning isn't my strongest suit. With much love, Uzumaki Namikaze Naruto, he's a goddamned lunatic. Piccolo screeched, scorching the letter with a flare of his key, this is suicide. If we had allowed them to land we could have taken them by surprise or maybe done an all-out assault but thanks to this half-cocked moron he's going to drop our enemies off at our front door. As if God was planning a sick, cruel joke on the trio a knock came at the door, leaving each member of the abode breathless. Each member dropped into a prepared stance, focused their key and just as Jine was ready to twist the knob they heard a soft, feminine voice call from the opposite side, um, hello. Is this the right address? I know there's not that many random wooden houses out in the middle of the barren plains but, you know, you can never be too careful. Hey, it's Krillin, Gohan cheered, pushing through Piccolo and Jine to swing their door wide open before tackling the bald monk with as much love and power she had. With a big oof Krillin dug in her heels and received her half Saiyan bullet train hug with a chuckle. Hey, hey, easy now little one, if you hit me any harder you'll pop a rib. If you can't handle a child you might want to sit out this one, Krillin, 
Piccolo chuckled, giving a typical Piccolo sneer towards her. Krillin tried her best to ignore the pointed ear bastard snide comment which was soon followed by Jines, you're not wrong, Piccolo, Nappa's punch packs a bit more power, I'd hate for you to be splattered on the first swing. Gimme a break here, I've been training all year for this, you think I am gonna sit this one out, she said defensively, releasing the youngling before taking a stand against her detractors. With a snicker, Piccolo commented, you show slight improvement, it'll give you that, but his eyes then drifted towards the horizon, and what about the other idiots? They'll be here shortly, I was just closer, she remarked before leaning in and whispering towards Gohan, s so, um, where's the blonde? Blonde? Gohan hummed, tapping her chin, oh, you mean Naruto, right? Hey, why don't you announce it to the whole damn mountainside while you're at it, Krillin grumbled, clamping a hand over Gohan's mouth to try and silence her boisterous voice, be but yeah, where's he? Piccolo merely chuckled, a sense of morbid humor filling it, humph, if you're looking for that moron you'll have to wait, hell be back with our Saiyan guest. Krillin's eyes, much like Piccolo and Gohan moments prior, shot from her head, what? To minimize civilian casualties he's going to be bringing the Saiyans to us, Jine continued. If he can do that why not just take them out entirely, huh? If he wants to minimize casualties the best thing to do is for him to take them on, Krillin pondered, if he was able to handle Jine in decisive fashion why couldn't he do the same for the other Saiyans? Good question, Jine said, her voice dripping with scorn before turning her gaze to her green partner, oh Piccolo, care to explain? Piccolo's expression shifted towards a more complacent sneer, he's not going to be fighting alongside us. Krillin's face grew pale. I, I think I forgot something at Came House, I best, she began, inching backward before she was interrupted by Piccolo's snarled words. Coward. Do you have any pride as a warrior? He growled, as you've said, we've trained this whole time for their arrival, I think we'll be fine without that bumbling buffoon. Piccolo's confident stance seemed to work its magic keeping Krillin steadfast on the battlefield for the time being. Look. Gohan pointed skyward, drawing the other's attention to a growing dimensional split that started to expand from then air. Once the strange portal was sizable enough the visage of Naruto slipped through the gap with ease, scanning the area before he caught a glimpse of the party. It's Naruto, good morning. Good morning to you too, Gohan, Naruto cooed, floating himself elegantly down to their side before placing a gentle hand on the newcomer's shoulder and it's good to see you again, Krill, how's your year been? Krillin's face was instantly flushed with color, trying her best to keep her composure, oh, why you know, brutal, grueling, t the usual. Well now, whatever you and your friends did with Mr. Popo it did wonders for you, I can feel your progress, he smiled, much to the ire of Jine as she watched the short monk soak in her master's praise. Krillin's eyes seemed to brighten at Naruto's kind words, why you can? Of course, he chuckled, cut the pleasantries, master, Jine spoke, her tone a bit more curt than usual, where's Vega and Nappa? Oh yes, yes, they'll be here any moment, with the sound of a raging rocket, two spherical pods shot from the still open portal Naruto created, careening about a mile south of the group before landing into a craterous mound on the plain's surface, speak of the devil. As the dust settled from their crash the pods doors let out an audible hiss allowing them to slowly open to reveal its contents. First to emerge was a bald juggernaut of a being, he towered over his pod and his companion that stood to his left, his armor was similar to Jine when she first arrived on earth but held a black and yellow color scheme with white accents around the pectorals and abdominal area. His partner was quite short, not Krillin level but compared to her compatriots it was telling, her hair was spiked high, adding a few inches to her height along with a braided low ponytail trailing down her back with three distinct brass couplings keeping it maintained, her armor, similar to her partner, was gold and white along with a purple bodysuit that rested underneath. Have you been preparing for us? The shorter of the two hummed, taking her first step onto the earth's soil, with a sinister smirk, she said something that a shiver down her enemies, wed hate to let it go to waste. Well, 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 it seems like they brought out the welcoming committee for our arrival, Vega sneered, taking a few lofty steps away from her spherical pod as she took in the scene. What do you say, Nappa, should we greet them? A chuckle left the lips of her larger-than-life companion. Sounds good to me, Vega. I could use the exercise after being stuck in that pod for a year, Nappa joked, rolling his shoulder to stretch his underused muscles, let's just hope they don't break as easily as the Arlian. Agreed, 
And with that, the two made their way towards the group, levitating with ease until they were mere feet apart, Naruto now standing between the newly arrived Saiyans and his team. So, you two must be Vega and Nappa, correct? Naruto asked calmly, a chipper smirk ever present on his features as he addresses the newly arrived threat. We've been waiting for your arrival. Sorry about your change in landing location. I felt like this would be the best place for our encounter. You're right. This isn't exactly the place we were programmed to land, Vega commented, taking in their strange new surroundings, was that your doing? With a nod, Naruto responded, Hi, I'd prefer to keep collateral damage to a minimum if it can be helped. The bald Saiyan couldn't help but cackle at Naruto's remark, Oh, it looks like we have a bleeding heart here, worried about the people, are we? T this is insane, doesn't he feel those power levels? They're walking monsters but he's talking to them like it's nothing. Krillin shivered as the aura of these two Saiyans mere presence alone was enough to make a sane man turn and leave. Senseless death won't be tolerated as long as I still draw breath, said the blonde, standing firm against the giant ape scare tactics, which also includes the two of you. I will only say this once before we begin. Leave this planet. This is your first and last warning if you wish to leave here in one piece. Oh ho! Quite the statement, Vega proclaimed, shielding her laughter with the back of her hand. Shut up, shut up, Krillin thought, her eyes nearly bulging from her skull at Naruto's brazen defiance against the Saiyans. You're too soft, master, Jain commented, taking a stand next to her supposed master, I wouldn't have given them the option. There you are Raditsa, I didn't see you cowering in the back, said Nappa, but to be fair, I de hide my sorry face too after being turned into a human's lapdog. Don't talk to me like you're a free man, Nappa. The former Raditsa snapped with fervor, Vega has always kept you on a short leash. Low-class scum like you have no right to, a vein grew visible on the bald mon's massive forehead, preparing himself to take charge against Jine only for his supposed handler to raise her hand in protest. Nappa, enough talk. We've come here for a reason, the Dragon Balls, where are they? Vega asked and though her words seemed to be neutral, her tone was laced with malice for those who were unwilling to answer her. B but, no one knows where they are, we haven't gathered them for a whole year. Krillin instinctively blurted out only to, in turn, get a harsh slap to the back of the head courtesy of Piccolo. A whole year you say? Vega hummed don't listen to them. Vega, obviously they can't be trusted to tell the truth. Nappa stepped forward, aiming his bloodshot eyes towards the smallest of the group. Krillin, make no mistake, we will find these dragon balls, with you alive or with you dead, it's your decision. We're not here to bow down to your demands, got that? Piccolo proclaimed, we're here to fight. So go ahead and try and make us, you'll find it much harder than you anticipated. Vega merely sighed before turning to her armored cohort, it would seem like they're not going to tell us about the Dragon Balls willingly. Wanna bet? Nappa snickered before going for his scouter that rested on his left ear. Now, let's see what we're dealing with, with a press of a button. His scouter sprung to life cataloging each fighter that stood before him by power level with relative ease. The Saiyan Brat and Raditsa are at 1400, and 2000 Nappa murmured, hovering over Gohan and Jain before flicking his eye towards the green fellow, the Namek is at 1600, the Midget is at 1100 and, get this, Blondie's not even picking up on the scouter, the Brute had a chuckle at his findings, proclaiming, you mongrels really think you can be lobing around threats like that with such weak power readings? But his partner Vega didn't seem as tickled by the readings as Nappa was. Nappa, she began, pulling her scouter from the side of her head, those figures are most unreliable. What do you mean Vega? Questioned her second in command, tapping the side of his scouter as if there was some form of malfunction. Tossing it over her shoulder, Vega began to explain, these earthlings seem to have learned to concentrate their power, allowing them to raise and lower it at will, if we follow the scouters we might bite off more than we can chew. Ah, yeah, you're right, he hummed, discarding his scouter alongside Vega, from the recordings we gained from Raditz's battle, she was fooled by that same simple parlor trick. Impressive, Naruto remarked with a slight nod, you two aren't so easily fooled. You've got that right, pal. You're talking to two elite Saiyan warriors, the cream of the crop, Nappa boasted, pointing a jagged, judgmental finger towards their turncoat kin, don't you dare compare us to her. T this is bad. This is really bad. Now our only ace in the hole has been seen through. Krillin began to sweat, 
inching closer to Piccolo and Gohan before whispering, H hey guys, if these two are stronger than Jain was, Goki isn't here yet and Naruto's decided to become a pacifist all of a sudden, how on earth are we going to win this? Keep your head, Krillin, Piccolo remarked, his voice still filled with nerves but steadfast in the face of their combatants, we've trained for a full year for this, if they think we're still as weak as we were before then they're in for a surprise. A hey, alright, I, I I guess you're right, Krillin grumbled, shuffling back to her spot before catching a glimpse at Naruto staring at her. With a confident grin, Naruto proclaimed don't worry, Krill, no one will die while I am around. Thanks, I guess, she murmured, surprisingly bewitched by his statement. I think it's time, Nappa, let's have a little fun with them before we get those dragon balls, Vega hummed before an idea popped into her little head, a twisted grin appearing on her lips, better yet, how about we test out those Saibaman, we should have at least six left. Haha, <laughs> you're too much, you really do know how to have fun. Nappa sneered before digging behind one of the flaps that dangled from his battle armor before producing a clear capsule that held several seeds and a liquid suspended underneath them, you're right, there's only six. Maybe the Saibaman can persuade them to tell us where the Dragon Balls are, huh, Nappa? Jain's body tensed as she glared daggers towards the two, seemingly enraged by what these Saibaman truly were. Hold it, stated the dimensional hopper, causing the duo to halt with a simple raise of his hand, now. I'd hate to ruin your nasty plan with your Saibaman but I believe it's time for me to step in. Huh. Was all Nappa could muster as he glared dumbfounded at the blonde, did he seriously just tell them to hold it? A human whose power reading came in at a whopping zero is demanding the two strongest Saiyans alive bend to his will, he truly must be insane. For my own personal reasons I've removed myself from the coming fight but that doesn't mean that I'll allow this to divulge into a barbaric brawl. Naruto began. So, I've decided to make this into a tournament. He proclaimed, clasping his hands together before softly whispering. Release allowing a structure to come into view, the scenery around them melted away as the dirt that their feet once rested on gave way to a grid-like ring floor that expanded outwards into a 50-yard, 150-feet, circle. No one could really find the words for what just happened. Even the Saiyans seemed to be dumbfounded by how such a structure could have been under their feet the whole time, and yet they couldn't even feel a thing. The rules are simple, one versus, one combat unless each team agrees on multiple opponents, the contestants battle one another with everything they've got until the opponent yields or is unable to battle, murder and outside interference is strictly prohibited, if I find either side break these rules I will deal with them personally, am I understood? W what? Krillin asked, still fully disoriented by everything that happened. When on earth did you come up with this harebrained idea? Piccolo shouted snagging naruto by the collar of his cloak this isn't a game damn it you're playing with our lives and that's exactly why i am doing this piccolo naruto asserted removing piccolo's hand effortlessly if we did it your way they could easily kill you but if we do it my way this world has a chance oh yeah and how do you reach that conclusion we can buy enough time for goki to arrive while whittling down their numbers naruto's voice held firm as his gaze pierced piccolo's seething look I am not sure about Vega but I know, if done correctly, you all can defeat Nappa. Even with his explanation, Piccolo couldn't see this plan as anything more than a suicide mission, with this foolhardy tournament idea he's drastically cut down their numbers advantage, now they'll have to face off against these brutes one by one with nothing other than Naruto's promise they won't be murdered by these animals, shooting a glance at Jain, Piccolo shouted, what about you, Jain? Do you really think this is our best plan of attack? Jain's gaze was still trained on the two Saiyans, her arms folded underneath her chest, may I speak freely, master? Of course, with his decree, Jain let her true emotion slip as a smile etched its way across her features, I am excited. Why you can't be serious? Piccolo proclaimed, how could you be excited after everything you've said over the past year? For the past year, I was doubtful that anyone could defeat these two. I've watched them slaughter whole worlds with a flick of their wrist but now. Standing in front of them again with a whole year's training under my belt, I feel like I can actually beat them, her explanation could be seen as nothing more than ego but to a Saiyan ego and pride are mostly all they have in terms of emotional range, whether it was an all-out brawl or the twisted tournament idea her master had concocted they were going to clash no matter what but now, in a one-on-one -on -one fight she knew she could throw out all the stops, I have to beat them. 
Piccolo's eyes seemed to lighten at Jine's proclamation as he stifled a chuckle, of course, you're just like your sister, hungry for a fight until your last breath, sighing. Piccolo turned to face their opponents, fine, you best pray this idea of yours works. Thank you. Piccolo, has everyone lost their minds? Krillin squealed, seemingly unraveling at the growing acceptance of this challenge. W what makes you think those monsters will even agree to this tournament? Don't worry, Krill, they will. Naruto said simply before making his way towards the two Saiyans who, at the time, still seemed a bit shell-shocked by the reveal of the ring along with his decree. As he grew closer and closer he began to notice the large size difference between Vegas' right-hand man and himself even at 62 he was still a foot and a half taller than him. The only one on their team close enough to the mon's height was Piccolo. Along with his size, his build was like something out of a comic book. It must have been his alien biology but his muscular body dwarfed anything Naruto had seen throughout his life. It was unnatural, but even with his size and build Naruto couldn't even muster a shudder of fear as he stood before them. His eyes locking not with the hulking mass of muscles but the true leader, the strongest of the two, Vega. Naruto may not be able to sense this key that this dimension uses but he can always tell presence, threat level, and pure, unadulterated power and comparing the two would be like comparing a mouse to a mighty lion. Vega's strength dwarfed her bald friend and nearly everyone here today, which is something that posed a problem with Naruto's pacifist desire. Well, it would seem one of them finally worked up the nerve to approach us, Vega sneered, quickly followed by her less articulate friend. Yeah, and they sent the weakest of their group too, maybe they want to thin out their ranks. I am sorry for the wait, I needed to discuss a few things with my friends, Naruto responded humbly, treating the two Saiyans as if they were simple house guests and not planet-hopping murderers, so, are you ready for the tournament to begin? Cocking a brow at his strange behavior Vega fired back with, I guess you're under the impression that we're actually going to play along with this charade? Yes I am, he nodded emphatically, Nappa stepped forward, invading Naruto's personal space in the process, why's that, small fry? Well, what do you lose if you don't? He asked with a simple shrug. You said you desire the Dragon Balls, yes. Well, if you win I'll retrieve them for you. A tempting offer, but, Vega began as she snapped her fingers, causing Nappa to flex and unleash his powerful energy, sending a shockwave throughout the field that shook all in attendance, what's stopping us from taking you and your team apart until you tell us? That would be me, Naruto said matter-of-factly, seemingly unfazed by their attempted threat. You think you can stop us, little man? Nappa laughed, his massive frame hovering over the blonde in some vein attempting to scare the smaller man into submission. I don't wish to fight. I learned long ago that fixing the world's problem only makes its people weaker, the little man explained, however, it'll make you a deal. Oh yeah, whatcha got? Asked Nappa, if I can make you flinch without moving an inch, you'll participate in our tournament, he proposed catching the attention of the larger-than-life Saiyan in question, if I can't, you can rip me to pieces. Ha 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 ha. You. Make me flinch. Who knew humans could be so funny, he chuckled before nudging his partner with his elbow. What do you think, Vega? Vega had been analyzing Naruto ever since her threat fell on deaf ears. He had this strange air about him. The way he carried himself with absolute confidence gave her this odd pause, making her rethink her next moves carefully but her ego soon took over, conceding that there was no way this basic human could possibly pose a threat to either of them, he must be too stupid to realize how much a threat they could be, Nappa will surely beat that out of him, fine, have your fun, Nappa. Ya hear that, pipsqueak? You've got yourself a deal. Wonderful, Naruto proclaimed as the two made their way into the center of the ring, Nappa strolled confidently into the circle ring as he eyed up his competitor trying his best to think of a reason why someone like this would want to throw their life away. As the competitors took their positions Krillin and Gohan began to shiver at the build-up. Could this tournament idea be over before it even began? Were they going to see this newcomer splattered across his own ring? Piccolo and Jine tried their best to hold their composer but even they seemed to sweat at the coming battle. They knew well enough that Naruto had quite a few tricks up his sleeve but could it be enough to back up his challenge? The two, now standing a few feet apart, locked eyes in the world seemed to go silent as each member of the audience became glued to what was about to unfold. A few moments passed as the two opponents continued to trade looks, Nappa with a hungry gaze, prepared to devour his enemy with a powerful display while Naruto seemed to have a more quizzical look, almost as if he was studying the brute, hey, 
little man. What's the holdup? Nappa bellowed, stomping his foot impatiently. With the brute's stomp, Maruto seemed to snap from his studied gaze and respond with a polite, apologies. Haha. <laughs> Let me guess, you're rethinking your life choices, huh? How on earth did you find yourself where you are now? Nappa asked, a sneer etched onto his lips. Surprisingly Naruto started to chuckle alongside his bald adversary, no, I just had to narrow down my options. Really? Well, I hope you picked the right on, but before Nappa could finish his quip he felt a shift in the atmosphere as the light gravity of earth began to grow heavy and cumbersome across his body. For a moment Nappa took his eyes away from his target to try and compose himself only to look back a second later to see their surroundings had changed once more. However, instead of being greeted by a ring, the world around them seemed inverted, the blue sky along with the white clouds was reversed, the sky now a deep, blood red dotted with black clouds that loomed overhead, the sun that rested at its highest point moments ago was now swapped with a full moon, its craters and crevices seemed to be in crystal clarity for all to see. Looking at his surroundings, he realized the audience they once had disappeared from sight, leaving him alone in this strange new landscape with none other than Naruto Uzumaki. Nappa opened his mouth, trying his best to utter a single phrase but found it impossible, WW what the hell? He thought as sweat began to build across his brow. This must be be, his doing, Nappa deduced, stretching an arm forward in preparation for a key blast but found even mustering up enough energy to fire was a monumental task. As he glared towards his motionless adversary his skin began to crawl as a strange, crooked smile rested upon his lips, revealing jagged teeth, along with his unholy smile. His eyes had changed as well, their baby blue hue overtaken by red and his pupils were non-existent, replaced with three rings and a single dot in the center, those three rings were decorated with strange comma-shaped symbols that were unknown to the brute. This can't be real, muttered the burly Saiyan, a shiver striking through him, none of this is real. He protested, closing his eyes to the world in hopes that. Once he opened them again, hell be greeted with his own reality. However, as his gaze graced this twisted world again. Something had changed but not for the better, Naruto's body had begun to contort. Shifting and twisting into horrid ways, as his skin started to protrude as if there was something within him trying to claw its way out. Soon his body gave way to an amorous mass of brown flesh that held a single red eye in the center of its body, it was titanic in size, dwarfing even an Uzaru in scale as it loomed overhead as its full body started to form. Spikes protruded out its back as its long arms stretched out towards Nappa, slamming down feet from him, with no sign of hind legs, the creature used its arms to drag itself closer to Nappa until its body was a foot away, leaving Nappa quivering in his Saiyan boots. FF fight back. Nappa screamed inside but his body refused to listen, remaining limp and feeble as the creature's mouth began to form, revealing a wide maw filled with rows and rows of teeth, do something, anything. The Saiyan cried, his teeth gritted in fear as the large beast's mouth grew closer and closer, inches from devouring him, run. A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-A-
B but, Vega, that's enough, Vega sighed, seemingly ashamed at her partner's temperament, you lost, get over it. H hi, Vega, with a lowered head, Nappa retreated back to his partner's side. So, does that mean you'll, Naruto began, looking to Vega for her answer. Yes, yes, well play along with your silly little game, she responded curtly before turning her attention back to Nappa, unbelievable, how could you have fallen for such a cheap trick? He shook his head in confusion, I, I swear Vega, something happened out there. Of course there was, you idiot, he put you in a trance, she remarked, making sure her voice was soft enough for no one other than them to hear it. I don't know how but for a split second his eyes turned from blue to red when you looked at him, with that discovery fresh in her mind she couldn't help but think, whoever he is we should nt underestimate him. But then why the hell are we agreeing to this fool's plan? Her apish friend hissed. Because there was no rule against it, he worded his deal carefully, clever bastard, she spoke, venom slipping through her words like a snake through grass, but it doesn't matter whether we play by his rules or our own, one way or another we're leaving here with the dragon balls. Right, the bald ape huffed, he knew he needed to let it go but his Saiyan pride wouldn't allow it, how dare this fool use cheap tricks to gain the upper hand, but he knew soon enough he was going to make that meek freak pay for what he did. Seeing as everything has been agreed upon I think it's time for our tournament to begin. Naruto proclaimed joyously, striking a powerful pose to add to his pomp and circumstance, contestants, choose your first combatant. The Saiyans were quick to respond, pulling out the vial of seeds and goo once more, I think we'll be starting with our little Saibaman if you don't mind. But of course, Uzumaki smiled, unwilling to escape this strange announcer facade he has placed upon himself. With the Mont's approval, Nappa made his way about five feet from the ring before using his massive index finger to punch an inch deep hole into the soil six times before depositing his seeds into them. Once covered he pours the green ooze on top of the six piles before taking a step back to allow the creatures to grow, not a minute passed before the freshly dug soil began to give way to reveal six bulbous creatures, the so-called Sabaman, as they clawed their way to the surface to reveal themselves to the world. Standing about a head shorter than Vega these creatures had large, misshapen heads covered in pulsating veins and a large crack that went from the bridge of their non-existence nose to the back of their skull. Their skin was a sickly yellow except for their abdomen which was a more mossy green and held the texture of armor, their arms and legs were lanky and about the same length as its body, each digit adorned with sharp claws that looked to be ready to rip through the flesh of its enemies, now fully formed the group of freshly made Saibaman stood with gleeful smiles, their beady little red eyes scanning their soon-to-be foes with murderous intent. Good lord, what are those things? Mumbled Krillin, trying her best to hide the fear oozing from every pore in her body. Saibaman, Jain began with her teeth gritted, biotechnology created by Saiyan hands, perfect for quick extermination of a weak-willed planet or, for the stronger Saiyan children, training partners. You're telling me that the Saiyan race made, T those things? Asked the half-Saiyan, noticing a few of these freshly grown creatures eyeing her up with a sinister grin. The modern version of them, yes, Jain continued, they were originally found native to a planet our race conquered, once we arrived we saw their interesting gestation period and decided to steal their seedlings and genetically alter them. The original Saibaman were ruthless, barbaric creatures that were too stupid to understand the simplest of commands. Now their raw power is more controllable and they are bound by their handlers. Glad to know that all Saiyans are monsters, not just these two, Piccolo commented, seemingly agitated by this newly released information. Bravo Raditsa, I am impressed, Vega nodded patronizing the Saiyan's history lesson with a slow, sarcastic clap, but tell me, how many of these could you defeat during our younger years? Jain refrained from answering, allowing Nappa to jump in, I think the answer you're looking for is zero. I am not the same Saiyan as I was before, Jain remarked passively, glaring down her once team members with a stare reserved for sworn enemies. Once scum, always scum, Vega remarked indifferently before turning to face Naruto, human. I am tired of this pageantry, begin your tournament. Very well. With a simple nod Naruto pointed towards the Saiyan's corner. The Saiyans have chosen their first combatant, before taking aim towards his own corner. Have you come to a decision as to your first combatant? You're looking at him, a voice called out before as if on cue. A man dropped from on high and landed directly in the center of the ring. His back to Naruto and his wild mane of hair blowing in the breeze, 
Standing before the orchestrator of this tournament was a nicely built male who wore a bright orange GI very similar to Goki's on the day she left for the other world. Even with the matching cane symbol emblazoned on his back, whipping around to face Naruto he revealed a large X scar across his left cheek and a long scar across his right eye which added to the Mon's more wild appearance. Sorry I am late. The area seemed to go silent as everyone stared absently at the new arrival. It was only after a minute of stone-cold silence that Naruto responded. Who the hell are you? His statement seemed to suck the dramatic aura from the man as everyone could see the color drain from his face. Oh oh. They didn't tell you we were coming. The man asked sheepishly, a complete 180 from how his entrance portrayed him. We? Who's we? Fatted Bias, another spoke up, floating down from above with a partner tagging along for the descent. The newly arrived duo was quite the sight to see, a bald, three-eyed human and a chalk-white red-cheeked child who seemed to float wherever he went. The tallest of the two wore a simple one-shouldered GI while the other wore a black hat that composes most of his head that ended with a red ball at the tip along with a white tank top with green pants and a wrap around his waist to mash. I told you this was a stupid idea. W what? The long-haired fellow spun to his left, his eyes buggy. Don't try to throw me under the bus here, pal. I ran this by you and you said ITD be perfect. The Triclops could only scoff at the Mon's wild accusation. I said do whatever you please, don't put words in my mouth, Yamcha. Then why did you hang back with me, huh? Stop trying to act so cool, Tien. Yamcha fired back. Will you two shut it? This time the floating toddler spoke, trying his best to be the voice of reason in this situation. Naruto cleared his throat, catching the two's attention. Excuse me but once again I must ask, who the hell are you people? Hey, Tian, Chaotsu, Yamcha, Krillin called from the sideline, what took you guys so long? Oh, hey there Krillin, didn't see ya there, Yamcha smiled, rushing over to see his longtime friend. Scratching his chin Naruto began, Tian, Chaotsu and Yamcha. Wait, you're the other Z fighters, correct? He asked, pointing a questioning finger towards Tian. Yes, that would be us, Tian replied before granting Naruto a respectful bow. Apologies for our late arrival. Yamcha thought ITD be cool to make a fashionably late entrance and I let him talk me into going along with it. Oh, that makes a bit more sense now, Naruto chuckled before extending a hand to greet the newcomers, it's nice to meet you, my name is. Tien took his hand, Naruto, right? Naruto nodded, H hi, are you a mind reader? Hum. N no, no, of course not, Krillin told me a lot about you, like, a lot. A lot he said with a light chuckle. My name's Tian Shinhan and this is my friend Chaotsu. Nice to meet you. Chaotsu smiled, his smaller hand being engulfed in Naruto's. It's a pleasure, little one. Enough of this. Nappa's voice cut through the pleasantries. It's bad enough I have to play along with this foolish tournament of yours but I won't allow you to stall any longer. Bring us our opponent now. Jeez. Who pissed baldly off? Yamcha chuckled looking to see if his joke landed only to see the team surprisingly tense at the moment, hum, tough crowd. He's right though, Naruto remarked, pointing once again towards the Z fighters, who shall be your combatant. Combatant? Wah. Yamcha began but was quickly made aware of the situation by Piccolo. Naruto's made us compete in a tournament against the Saiyans, they've already picked their fighter, a Saibaman, now we have to pick ours. A tournament? Tien questioned. Why a tournament of all things? Well talk about it later. Right now I don't want to keep pissing off the Saiyans. They might stop playing nicely if we do. Krillin spoke, pulling Tien back a tad behind the Z warriors. Well, if no one else is gonna step up. Yamcha chuckled, stepping into the ring with a cocky strut. I guess it'll have to. Why Yamcha? Don't be so cocky. You have no idea ho. Krillin began only for Yamcha to shoot her a thumbs up. Stop worrying so much, Krillin, I am not afraid of some overgrown onions. Yamcha boasted, stretching out the muscles in his arms before sliding comfortably into his stance. Besides, it's only fair, I made everyone wait so I might as well show them it was worth it, a few of the Z warriors could be seen rolling their eyes at such a statement but, whether they liked it or not, Yamcha was their first combatant, quickly scurrying into the ring, the Saibaman squared up against his boastful adversary each with a determined look in their eyes as they prepared for what was to come. Raising his arm high, Naruto began, Contestant, are you ready? With a nod from both, 
He let his arm drop as he bellowed forth, Hajime, thanks for watching.